All right, Luke, it appears we're talking about good companies or well-built companies owning bad projects versus poorly built companies owning great projects. And, and more specifically, how do you use that to find winners in the future? That's kind of the idea today. And you have a few examples here, uh, but let's maybe kick it off by, by setting the stage first, if you will, and talking about what's a good versus a bad vehicle and then talking about what's a good versus a bad project. There's a couple of words that I wanted to say here on on that because uh, kind of from my in, inexperienced perspective, also non-geo just basically had nothing to do with the space up until like a couple of years ago. So how do I deal with it and, and see what you think about that? But let's kick it off first with with bad companies or good 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 companies. So like the the vehicle, the, the stock, if you how do you how do you determine that? What are you looking at? Well I made a list um myself because I think if you listen to this program uh, every now and then, uh, the one that we do together, uh, people probably have a good idea what I care about. Um, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but it's, it's. I mean, it's not very difficult. So you, you tend to repeat yourself quite quickly. Also, if you re- listen to Rick Rule, he repeats himself quite often. And I think it's because at some point you find a way, uh, a procedure or maybe a way to invest in these things. And it always comes down to a few important things depending on your own uh, way of looking at things. And in my case, it's often share structure and warrants. Um, so what I did, I made a list of companies where I, without really looking at anything on my computer, just writing down like which things would I think about if I think about good companies. Uh, and of course, good is very general. It could be something of a, a company that's worth a billion or two mil, uh, in terms of market cap. It could also be a $2 million company, but very different in terms of good, like more potential type thing. Um, and, and then I, when I wrote down those companies, then I took all the data together. Um, and then you see that all of them have a similar, not all of them, most of them have a similar profile in terms of high insider ownership, often one or two uh, well-known names. So if there's a young person running the company, there's often a experienced person backing him. Um, You see uh, not many shares outstanding in most cases, not too many warrants outstanding in most cases. Um, In most cases, no extreme salaries. So I was quite surprised to, uh, even though I expected it a little bit, I was surprised to see such a high inside account on average in my list. Uh, I want to see people have a bit of the same driver than me. If I own stock and the CEO mostly makes it, an income and has no stock, then of course we have different perspectives on uh, what we want to achieve. So uh, good company, uh, we can discuss in more detail, but good company means uh, good share structure and people who are aligned with um, the the shareholder. Hmm. Well, good share structure, is it necessarily no warrants? Is it, how, how would you, because you, you know, you can, you can have a good share structure of a company that has 200 million shares outstanding but you can have a bad structure of a company having 100 million shares outstanding. So, they, I mean, is it is there a fixed rule? What do you look at? Yeah, no, that's true. Um, there are companies with two or 300 million shares out that still have a pretty good ownership, um, uh, maybe five or 10 big shareholders that make up 70% of the stock. And some companies just have the philosophy or CEOs have the philosophy of, we are not going to roll back. Uh, we are going to add value our way and and then the shares, the 200 million shares or 300 million shares are not going to be a big problem over time. And I think I could agree with that if if people think about it properly. In most cases, I see companies with less than 100 million shares outstanding. Uh, Preferably, I I really mind the warrants. Um, And sometimes it's very difficult for companies to raise money without warrants. So I understand why companies uh, issue them. Uh, but to me, as an investor, to buy in the market, um, I prefer not to have any warrants in my way in the next two or three hundred percent of the stock move. If the stock is trading at ten cents, I prefer not to have any warrants up to thirty or forty cents. Uh, and in most cases, of course, warrants are way closer to the the current price uh, because my experience is that it's very hard to get through that price again. And of course, with a good discovery, things change. But in most cases, there is no discovery. And with little bits of good news, you also want a bit of share price reaction to raise at a higher level again and and make a bit of progress in terms of market cap and in terms of cost of capital. And if you always stay below 10 cents until you have that wonderful day that may never come, 
uh, then you probably never uh, get above that warrant price until that warrant is gone. And that would be done with a warrant uh, or with a rollback or simply when the warrant um, uh, no longer exists after a number of years. But in, in, in many cases, again, they will issue new warrants and they will keep existing. So uh, the warrants really, really a big issue for me as an investor and, and, and almost always the reason why I wouldn't invest in in a name. Well, it's curious that you say that because it's it it's kind of the same in sports too, right? And in and in and in fitness, like if you don't see any type of of improvement over time, then you might quit. But it's really the the long term, you know, working out, for example, that gets you the most benefit. Uh, at least that's been the case for me. And so the the same is with a stock. Like if it never moves, but then it eventually moves, you know, ten times and nine hundred percent in a day, then maybe you're no longer holding it because there's no you know, there's no, there's no, there's no excitement. There's no point in holding it. W- which of the two, though, would you deem more important: good project or a good vehicle? Um, I would, I tend to say vehicle, but of course, there, there is very good vehicles with very bad people in it. Uh, I mean, there's so there's three thousand companies in Canadian junior space uh, in mining junior space that um, there's so many companies just rolling back, making an amazing structure, getting some people into it, put a fake promote into it, run it 10X and then sell it. I mean, that happens quite a lot. And that's not the vehicle I'm referring to. Um, If you refer to people really trying to do good work and finding new uh, showings, new uh, deposits uh, over time, those companies I refer to with insider ownership and with a good structure. Hmm. And I think a good example is, um, well, I took I, I took a couple of examples. I, I don't know if you want to jump into them, into them already. Um, yes. Let's because one of them is Targa. And, and I think Targa is a good example of pretty amazing backing. Uh, I mean, they have Discovery Group behind them uh, in Vancouver. And they have the Inventa Group behind them. They have, you know, big names backing the company. But really looking at the insider ownership, not too impressive. Looking at the warrants, problematic for me. Um, they have. I, I, I sent this chart in, um, and, and I, I included those red lines, those red dotted lines. And you see, 22 million warrants at 10 cents, and they have 6 million warrants at 20 cents, and 6 million warrants at 25, and 8 million warrants at 30. And this is a company with a project that came from Kinoland. I think Kinoland actually runs their on-site work. Uh, Zach told me about this project. I was quite impressed. It was early, but they found this five by four kilometer anomaly by doing till sampling and looking for lithium, finding a big gold anomaly on surface. Um, pretty impressive. Not too far away from Eleanor, a big gold mine. Hmm. And that's, I mean, I'm saying, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit by saying good project, bad vehicle. I'm going to do that a little bit more this episode. And of course, it's not always you know, 100% bad or 100% good. I'm just trying to make my point. Uh, in this case, I really hate the warrant structure. And that's the only reason I didn't buy because at $5 million market cap, I think I would normally buy this company. Uh, big anomaly, good people backing it. Um, of course, very early, but that's the type of potential I want to put some money into at $5 million and just wait. And in my opinion, if they didn't have any warrants, this market cap would have slowly grown to maybe 15 to 20 million. And then you have a way to finance at a lower uh, dilution. And uh, that's why I sort of hate them doing these war- financings at six, seven, eight cents with warrants on top of it. In my opinion, they are completely responsible for the share price being where it is. Hmm. The, when you mention the people, it's it's that's actually interesting because I, I count the people as part of the project as opposed to part of the vehicle. I can explain why where I hope it's going to make sense. Cause, and I wrote down a couple of things um, that I wanted to go through and, and kind of show them from my, again, inexperienced perspective, get your opinion on it, but also get people watching this who are more experienced and have had success, get their opinion on how they deal with this. And I've been, I've been repeating this really a lot these past few weeks because it's kind of stuck in my head since Craig Perry told me about this, but he's got a checklist for how to find a good, a good opportunity, basically. And he's got, you know, he's been involved in at least a, a few over the last decade or so. He is involved here in Targa with um, Invent the Capital. But so his checklist is really simple. So he goes size of the prize, cost of the test, chances of success. And so the first two are rather obvious. So the size of the prize, how big can the deposit get? You know, we kind of look at the 
Um, you look at the anomaly, as you, as you mentioned, that you're being pitched because hopefully you're not as degen as me to get pitched on a pre-anomaly place, although I let myself get pitched on these sometimes. But so you look at the size of the anomaly, for example, you dust up the good old size formula, which is uh, length by width by depth to get the volume of the rock. So you then take the volume, you multiply by you multiply the volume by the rock density. That'd be oftentimes uh, around 2.8. Not always, but oftentimes it is somewhere in that range, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9. So you multiply volume by grade, uh, by, by by rock density, and then you multiply that by grade. Uh, grade that's typical. You know, you're guessing here at this point because sometimes there's no drilling. Sometimes there is. Um, if there's no drilling, then you're kind of guessing. So you look at what's what's a typical grade for that specific type of deposit and that specific type of, of, of overall setting. So you can use comps here. Uh, you look at the neighbors and so on. And then you basically, you're basically done. So you do uh, volume by rock density by grade. But what I like doing is taking a best, a worst, and a mid-level scenario where my best case scenario typically um, discounts that the, that whole formula by 20%. My mid-level discounts it by 50%. And my worst case discounts it by 80%. So again, volume by density by grade multiplied by 0.8 for the best case scenario. 0.5 for mid and 0.2 for the worst case scenario. So that those uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, of course, the percentages, that's your discount rate. Now that's my starting point, size of the price. How big could it get? And then I have, okay, worst case, this is getting that big. That's my size of the price. Then I have cost of the test. That's a rather obvious one too, but very important. How much is it going to cost them to come up with a, or to make a discovery if we assume they would? And I'm getting to that as well. But how much is it going to cost them to come up with targets to begin with? You know, typically that's well, and that's why I like Africa, for example. There's there's soil geochem they can they can do, which is cheap. You know, walking the project. Then there's Termitaria, where they basically Awali Resources had it last week. Um, they assay a few ants essentially. Uh, so those ants they go like 30, 40 meters into the ground, and then they assay them, and then they would do IP on the back of that, which is also not it ha it's quick. And it's and it's cheap cost of the test when I talk about that, by the way, time is also of the essence, obviously. So I don't want it to take too long. And so in staying on the Awali example, they are going to do an IP on that, uh, which is supposedly cheap and supposedly quick or hopefully quick. And then you have you essentially have your drill targets for not much, right? And then it puts you in the right path. And then if there's an opportunity for RC drilling, that's cheap, of course. Um the most obvious cost here is diamond drilling. Like how much does a meter of drilling cost? There's places in Africa where it's going to be 150 bucks a meter for diamond drilling plus the assays. And then there's places in the Andes where it's 1500 bucks a meter. But this is where I typically do a ratio of the size of the price to the cost of the test. So, I mean, you know, cost of mapping, cost of geophysics, geochem drilling and assays. Um, assays too, by the way. So at... Uh, Sometimes assays cost a lot, especially if there's no lab close by. Um, but obviously, the higher the cost of the test, the higher the risk. And so the larger the potential size of the prize has to be for me. Uh, now, that's kind of the obvious part. You know, chances of success is where it, where it really gets kind of complicated. This is also where the team comes in, in my opinion. So that's why I count the team on the asset side as opposed to on the vehicle side. Uh, my basic check here doesn't start with grade. I know a lot of people just look at grade and they're like, oh, if it's open pit, one gram is good. If it's under, underground, four grams is good. If we're talking about gold or the equivalents thereof and other metals. For me, it starts with understanding how well the company understands the target geology or the regional setting and, and their thesis. Because again, I'm not a geo, virtually no experience in this. And I have to trust their geo team. And this is also, again, the team comes into play, right? The technical team specifically because chance of success literally means how probable do I think it is for them, for, for that team to find what they are looking for. And that's why I need to know how well they think they understand the, the type of deposit. And of course, if they've been successful in identifying a similar deposit in a similar setting in a past or several times across their collective careers, then that chance does go Higher. Now, this is also where you can go into the geology and start talking about metallurgy and a bunch of other stuff that, that do matter to me. Metallurgy is, is of course, one of those sort of recovery rates um, next to grade and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, tr tr because trust is great, but verifying is, is always more satisfying, I suppose. So I can, you know, I can trust them, but I still will go over a few basic checks on, on kind of my, my pleb list, non-geo pleb list, if you will. 
And uh, yeah, that list of greatest part of it, metallurgy and a bunch of other things. I'm not going to go over it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to be talking for 20 more minutes. And I, I believe everyone's tired of listening to me. But what do you make of this whole thing that I'm telling you here? Like, am I making any sense? Is this is this a sound approach? Am I overcomplicating it? Am I oversimplifying it? What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you say. I, it's not that I, I don't always think the same way. Uh, well, you go through the same type of thinking process, I think, Uh I like the checklist as well from uh, Greg. Um, but for me, I mean, let me just take the Targa example. Um, I also think about how much do they still need to raise uh, to test? And what's the size of the price? Well, they have an anomaly of three by four kilometers, which is a big anomaly. And they, they need to find the source of the bedrock. I mean, they, they are assuming it comes from somewhere, of course. and. I'm not going to go into the technical too much, but how far can this anomaly be from the potential bedrock source? And that's how they need to test this. And they need to raise, raise money. And so far, they have raised money at eight, nine cents or seven cents with a warrant. And um, they will need another round to get to the drilling stage. Uh, so if you would count up all those shares, you probably get to 150 or 200 million shares, um, maybe for $15 million or something. And if you would have done it maybe at a uh, slowly increasing share price, uh, maybe the dilution would have been, you would have been at 100 million shares or 18 million shares at the moment you drill. And now they are at 225 million shares at the moment they drill. Uh, so they have a big target, big price, I think. And of course you don't know yet, it's still sampling, it's early, but they have the potential for something big. So price big, um, it's not too expensive. I think with 10 or $15 million, they can, you know, make the discovery if there's a discovery to be made. Um, and you could argue that people could argue that um, who cares if they make a discovery and it goes to $1 versus $2 in my case without warrants. In both cases, you make it 10 or 15 and maybe the, with a warrant, it makes up for. Uh, so I agree in case of success, the difference between not having the warrants and having the warrants is not that, well, it could still be the difference between a 10 and 20 beggar. But that's not even my problem. If they fail in this target, how to, you know, are you going to move on with your company or are you going to quit the company? And I think that's where the problem often comes in. If you um, um, at some point conclude that this is not a project you want to proceed with and you go to a different project and you have 250 million shares out, including your warrants, let's say, then you almost have to do a rollback not to, you know, start at 250 million and go towards a billion very quickly. Uh, this company will roll back and you basically make a complete loss on your investment because you, you need another two or three years to get to your price and you need another 10 million. Uh, so I do think about the same thing. I just just think a little bit more in timeline of how many shares issued, how many warrants, at what point will that give you a bit of a share price response in case you want to trade it. If you don't want to trade it, you could argue it doesn't really matter. Um, but then the issue is more that you really need a rollback to start over again. I think that 80 or 90% of the companies at some point in some shape or form have to start over again because they conclude that their main target is not going to work. And then that's when the problem ar arrives. Um, of course, it's my decision to, I, I try to make a profit even if they don't make a discovery. And of course, that would be a, a silly argument. Like if I tell the, the, the CEO, give me uh, no warrants, give me a, sh a share at 10 cents because I want to sell it at 10, 20 cents the moment you have a bit of a hype in your stock. That's not a very strong argument. But it is true that I would consider selling some of my stock at 20 or 25 cents. And I think it would have been there without the warrants in the case of Tariqa. Hmm. Um, so I'm not saying that my argument for one of wanting to see this no warrant deal because it allows me to potentially sell some stock at 25 cents is a good argument towards the company. But I do think the argument towards the company is that they can slowly build their share price and also raise at higher valuations. Um, and if they if they come up with good results, it gives me a good reason not to sell the stock because I don't own a warrant and selling it makes me no longer in a position to profit from it. So it makes my thinking process way more difficult. Like, do I want to sell this? If I do, I no longer have... You know, I'm not no longer positioned anymore with those shares. And with a warrant, you stay positioned. Because in Targa's case, they have warrants up to mid-2026. Mm. Um, so I think it answers more or less the same question, but I explained it a little bit different than you do with the checklist, basically, and uh, and uh, the ways, the methodology of getting to your drilling stage. Mm. 
Yes, um, and and I appreciate that view also because it is it's it's much less of a technical view, if you will. I mean, it's a view that relies much less on on the rocks only. Um, there's another note that I just thought of um, to make, and that is uh, that on, on the chances of success part of that formula is that some deposit types are just notoriously more challenging than other deposit types. And some deposit types, if you go to the the size of the prize, some deposits are typically larger than other types of deposits. And the same with the uh, cost of the test. You know, if you're looking for a Carlin type deposit, for example, they typically tend to be very deep. There was even a period of time where, where companies would you know, just list on the back of saying, oh, we're going to be looking for a Carlin type deposit, knowing that they can make excuses saying we didn't find it this time because it's deeper and deeper and deeper. And then sometimes it's 1500 meters or whatever. But so what I'm making, the point that I'm making here is that on that checklist to be good at it, you almost have to understand the different deposit types. And there's someone asked me on Twitter, how, do, how, do, how have you, how have you, how have you gone about learning about deposit types and, and geology and whatnot? And I made a, I made a list of, I think, eight or nine things on Twitter in my response to them saying, this is how I did it. But one of those main things is that, um, what, what's the name of the guy? It, it was this prod guy who did a, um, a series on deposit types. So if you look up, let me see if I, if I look up Sprott deposits, Andrew Jackson, I think. Andrew Jackson, that's it. Yes, yes, Andrew Jackson. Oh, yeah. So it's Ore Deposits One Hundred One by Andrew Jackson. It's um, it's a playlist that he made on YouTube, so it's completely free. That that's understanding those. You don't have to be a geo, but trying to understand those, watching those multiple times. I've watched them countless times, and I still don't understand the majority of what's being said. But at least somewhat understanding those can also improve your chances of of hitting hitting the right spots with that checklist. That's a note that I wanted to make here. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. I also listen to these things and I want to have a basic understanding of systems. Um, but if you trust the team, in this case, Kinoland is, is backing this. I know Zach for a number of years. And if I ask him and I, of course he is biased in a way, uh, but if he can explain me uh, this target in detail and I ask him you know, what they need to do, I don't need to know the details of the geology. I don't need to be sort of a semi-geologist to know exactly what they are going to do. I, I trust him enough that he that he tells me the truth about their, you know, the process to get to a drill stage. And if I understand that they have to drill, let's just say if, if, if the, the field work right now is successful and they can drill, let's say, 10 holes, I can make the math, you know, 10 holes of, of 200 meters times times $200. And I mean, it could be $250, but typically you can find out if they would need about three or five or six million and you get a feel. In this case, it makes a big difference, three or five or six million, uh, because it's a small company. Uh, but I don't think you need to understand geology that much to really understand it. In case of ATEX, for example, drilling very deep holes to find a porphyry, you know, I understand enough that that's more expensive and that you either need a joint venture partner or you need or you're going to dilute like crazy, or you need a, you know, a big backer to get you going. And in ATEX's case, Pierre Lassonde came in at 10 or 12 cents, and then the stock went to 40 cents, and um, and they raised, I don't know what the second raise was after he came in, but then you can raise at 50 cents or $1, $1.50. Of course, that makes life a bit easier. as a, And of course, that's an extreme example. If you, These people you cannot always get as a junior. Um, but to make the point that a higher share price is helpful, of course, to a junior company. And uh, if you keep on raising with lots of warrants at seven cents, sometimes it's impossible you know, to do it in a different way, but then you get these type of problems. If Targa this year gets to, or next year gets to a drill stage and drills a big discovery hole, the stock will go. Uh, hmm. So I, I just always assume that it doesn't happen because the likelihood is just, it, it's, in my opinion, uh, unresponsible if you think they will make a discovery. I always take a very, very small percentage chance. So what will happen if they don't make the discovery? You know, would they continue on it? Would they look for a new project? Uh, this is this target is good enough that it could also happen that maybe there's, I think there's a financing coming soon, looking at the balance sheet. Maybe they will attract a bigger company and maybe that company gives them a bit of a, a run, uh, either as a joint venture partner or maybe as a uh, investor. And if they get... I'm not going to name names because I'm just making this up right now, but I wouldn't be surprised that this company would find a bigger company to finance them. Mm. And that would, you know, that would slowly maybe improve 
the situation, uh, depending on you know the deal. But uh, I wouldn't exclude that option. And and five cents right now is really interesting. I, I I'm almost tempted to buy this stock um, if it wasn't for the warrants. This is actually a good point to also make a couple of caveats because going through a checklist like this and and for less experienced people like me, the first time when I heard this, I was like, oh, this is this is perfect. You, know, you just apply this checklist and it works 10 out of 10 times. Reality is like this slight using a checklist of sorts slightly improves your chances of success of your own portfolio, which are to begin with not very high, especially when you're when you're when you're beginning. And um Part of it too is that there's other things that come into play. You know, this when, when I go over the chances of success, and I'm talking about it geologically specifically. Another part of the chances of success is for the company to be able to keep existing in the first place, which is what you're touching upon here. So, having a good team to promote the story. When I say promote, that's a very dirty word in our space for some reason, but 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 promotion is absolutely necessary and should be done properly. Um, Having a team that knows how to talk about the story or how to translate the story to the target audience, having a target audience to begin with and all these things, like the, the, the marketing side of the story is very important to be able to keep the company afloat, keep a decent share price on it, keep financing it. That's also part of the chances of success. And there's a bunch of other caveats. So this is not a, not a, not a foolproof formula that, that we're talking about here. No, it isn't. Um, I Every situation is different, I think. Um, I have a couple of other examples with me as well today um, where I can, you know, make my point a little bit more. Um, and I think, my, you know, everybody has its own sort of philosophy and strategy and way of dealing with things. Uh, I think if we would invite, I mean, it would be interesting to have Rick Rule in this call and give us a counter argument in Targa's case. I think he would be perfectly capable to do, to do that. Uh, but it also is... is, is um, connected to your own way of investing and the way you're comfortable with it. Uh, and, and that's why this is my way. Uh, the, the second company I took with me is Fuerte, uh, a company I own uh, quite a bit of stock of. It's a pretty big position for me. Um, I am, uh, my, my cost basis is higher than the current price. So uh, I think the company is quite cheap and I'm, I'm a little bit unfair to them by saying good vehicle, bad project, because the project is not that bad, but it's not a project I would normally buy this company for. Um, they have Christina, uh, which is their main project. It's a um, gold, zinc, uh, lead, and a bit of silver, I believe, project. They have OK veins, you know, two, two or three meters wide, which is for Mexican standards quite wide. And the, the grades are OK-ish, but the gold, they are gold equivalent. Um, the team likes the project more than I do personally, and they are uh, geologists, so no more, but I feel like even if they continue to, to release these type of results, nobody would really wake up on these results unless they would do a resource at some point and they would surprise the market completely. Uh, but even if they would release a 2 million ounce resource or 2.5 million ounce resource with this grade in gold equivalent, including the zinc and the, and the lead, I'm not completely sure if that's the project that's going to make it. Perhaps. They think, yes, I doubt it. They have a nice porphyry project, uh, but a very like a long shot type project where if they hit, it's amazing. But the likelihood of hitting it, you know, they are in an amazing place between two very big projects of Newmont and Tech. Um, good project, but long shot. I think the play here, in my opinion, is um, a new project. They have communicated to the market that they are also looking at more advanced projects, maybe even production assets, and with this shareholder base um, and not having any warrants, maybe a couple of broker warrants, um, they can do that. They have Pierre Lasson, that Trinity Capital. They have a strategic investor. They have a lot of institutions behind them that paid a bit more like me in that financing of uh, $1.05, I think it was. Um, so this is a company where I think it will make you money, but the timeline is a question. What is going to drive the stock? Uh, the project may surprise me, but I doubt it. Uh, team, I mean, I, I had the discussion with the team and in Beaver Creek, and they think I'm wrong, and they think that it's, it's a high potential project. Christina, uh, I think that pro that this company will get going once they find another project, and then they become a sort of a 
four projects type company where they have a couple of long shots where you, if you get you know success with a higher share price you can finance the, those deeper drill holes on that poor free project but the main thing will then be a new project so that's why i called it good vehicle bad projects i would be really surprised if this stock um is not gonna do well uh with timeline uncertain which makes it boring for the time being uh but i don't really care boring yeah well the the mexican assets are curious to begin with i think that the, the chile assets might be more interesting or, or where they want to take this over the long run i also spoke to them in beaver creek but it's been a while since i've really sat down for a more in-depth i think beaver creek meetings are like 20 minutes and five minutes of small talks uh, or in my case 10 minutes of small talks um so i need to sit down with tim for a larger update on this but it's um I do see your point. I know where you're coming from, so I, I understand what you mean when you say bad project, which is, again, h- how do you how do you quantify or qualify that for, for, for being a bad project? But I understand your points there. Uh, you also have a couple of more examples on here. Do you want to go through all of them? Uh, well, it's, it's more to make the point. I think um, uh, Highlander Silver is not completely fair because I don't know own a lot. I saw it happen. Um didn't really make full use of it. Even at 50 cents, I thought, well, it's not that expensive. But I also had a bit of this psychological issue of seeing the seeing it at 15 cents, not buying it. Now having to buy it at 50 cents. Well, maybe I should have done it because it, it doubled uh, recently. Um, I think the recent news release that this becomes a Augusta go- company was a little bit of a... Yeah, for me, it was not a news release, really. Uh, because Richard Warwick already controls this company for a long time. And to me, it always was the Augusta company. Uh, it changed when the Lundins also came in and they bought this, this high-grade property in uh, Peru. And with this shareholder base, also including Eric Sprott, you have all the big names together in, in a sm- relatively small company and a high-grade project that they can start drilling uh, will for sure deliver some amazing assays. And uh, it's up to them, of course, to show that it's uh, worth their time. Uh, and I have not much doubt that these people can do that. Um, so that that's a play. I mean, I mean, sometimes it's it's easy, right? If you have these people coming together and all being positioned, uh, and it's an early an early play. Uh, the last couple of months, it was still you know with a thirty million market cap, you're not buying uh, a very expensive company, but still early stage, I think. Uh, this company has more war- warrants than I would like to, but those warrants are held by a couple of people, and that's Richard Warwick and the Lindins. Mm. Mm. Yes, and and so the the backing part of it is something that I, I I think I tend to ignore at first. Maybe I should maybe I should make it a bit bigger part of my analysis. No, it's a it's a big part of your your analysis as you've mentioned here, but there's not much I can I can add there. Yeah, I've got Sunpeak with me. I, I talked about it a couple of times. I'm very biased with Sunpeak. Um, this is a little bit of, I listened to your uh, Rick Rule uh, interview, and hmm. I think he mentioned that, um, I listened to, I mean, he is so often in the media that I may confuse your interview with another one, but I think it was your interview where he said, and he has said that before, that he would take uh, geological risk, um, uh, country risk, political risk, um, but maybe, but then he wants very good geology and I think in Sunpeak's case, um, if you look for big VMS projects with a good team, uh, you've got your uh, company. They have an amazing land package, very big targets. Um, they have not issued a share in five years uh, for unfortunate reasons because of the um, the war in, in Ethiopia. That was the time I was you know, buying stock in the market between... Well, 14 cents as the absolute minimum, but I started at 25 cents. So my average became 16, 17 cents, I think. Um, really, really good company. Started trading at um, at $1.10, $1.20 when they came public in the beginning. Um, and they're going to drill the, a couple of their best targets uh, this year and next year. Um, I, I think there's a financing coming uh, within now and six months. So that's perhaps still an entry possibility for people. Uh, that, that they have not raised money for a long time because they did have cash in the bank. That cash, of course, is now going away as they are drilling and exploring. Um, so that wouldn't take very long, I think. But um, I maybe after the drilling and maybe after drill success, they are going to drill some amazing t- targets. And um, so this is this is a geological reason, uh, but also no warrants, no sh- no 
not many shares outstanding, uh, most of it owned by insiders. Um, so very illiquid company, but yeah. exactly as I like it. It is a little bit hurtful that you would mistake my interviews for other interviews with Rick Rowe, but I'll just <laughs> pretend I didn't hear that part. Uh, <laughs> it was in my interview with him. Yes, you're right. Uh, and, and thanks for the shout out. But um, yeah, I, I still have a question mark on some peaks size of the prize because it is a VMS deposit. They're not necessarily small. We did a master class with uh, Greg on this. And so um, that's one point. And then, yeah, Rick said he'd rather take um, – jurisdictional risk than geological risk. That's kind of his point. But with Ethiopia, I'm not sure I'm certain because Ethiopia is splitting off of Africa. I don't know if you've heard, but that might be mm. the risk The risk for some peak. Yeah, yeah, I saw that video. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's still uh, 10 million years away, but uh, it may split off. And then finally, they can have their own harbor uh, because they are currently landlocked and have no access to the, to the ocean or to the sea. Well, hopefully Greg can drill the assets before before that, that happens, and hopefully we get to see it. But no, this was a good talk. Yep, it was fun. All right, moving on, we're going to Nevada and Oregon at the same time, as we'll be visiting Providence Gold, which is a story Luke and I came across in one of our weekly overviews a couple of weeks ago, as their stock had gone uh, from kind of a low of about $0.08 cents at the end of the summer into a high of $0.22 cents, uh, by the time we were talking about it, which is a, a uh, an almost 3x or a 200% gain on a relatively short time frame. Providence, by the way, trades under the ticket symbol PAU on the CSE in Canada, where an average of about 500,000 shares trade daily. Now, one of the reasons why the stock had jumped so much is because, well, first of all, this is a, was a sub $10 million company back then, so moving it wasn't all that hard. So when Providence put out a news release saying that the first hole at their El Dorado gold project, which is located again in eastern Oregon, had confirmed that gold mineralization extends in depth, well, the stock went up. That's the main reason, I suppose, why the stock is up that much. This hole, by the way, was designed to follow up on some of the reverse circulations of RC drilling that the company had completed in 2023, which had come back with over three grams of gold per ton over 114 meters and had ended in mineralization as well. Henceforth, they wanted to follow it up at depth. And so they did. And that was also mineralized, pushed the stock up. Specifically, the mineralized zone was showing some VG here and there. But importantly, Luke and I did say that there were no assay results yet and that there's also been historic drilling in the region. Although I didn't see a map showing the location of the first drill hole of this year's drill program in the news release relative to the historic holes. And in addition, there were more unknowns relating to the mineralizations or nation outration and stuff like that uh, of what's being drilled here. So hopefully that's all stuff that we'll get into later on in the conversation. For a little bit of a background to uh, the El Dorado property hosts a non-NI43-101 compliant resource estimate of roughly 2 million ounces at 0.73 grams per ton gold, which Provenance believes is being driven by a gold porphyry. Seen as a mineralization hosting, that resource is a hydrothermal system. Low temperature, though. So that's something I hopefully we'll talk about as well. So essentially, something has to be cooking up those fluids, but they're cooling off. I'm not going to say too much about that right now. Hopefully, we'll cover that uh, later on. Another one of the challenges that Luke and I had noted back then, though, is that while there weren't all that many shares outstanding, specifically at the time, we read that it, it was around 100 million shares outstanding when we talked about it. And the number of warrants was rather high at around 65 million, with a good chunk of that coming free th trading rather soon. And so potentially acting as a cap, if you will, on, or a drag on any potential share price move to the upside. And so the situation has changed a little bit since um, because Providence just closed a private placement to the tune of $1.5 million, which resulted in the addition of about 18 million shares and about 18 million new warrants. So it was a full warrant financing there. Uh, so the capital structure is something I hope to, we can touch upon later in the conversation, as well as um, just it, it, right now it sits at about 200 million fully diluted shares. But before all that, it'd be a good idea for me to shut up because I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> there has been historic drilling on this project. There's specifically over 240 holes dr drill here. So Rono, what, what are you doing differently here than the people who drilled these uh, 242 holes actually? And and walked away. And, and why do you think you have a better shot at growing that deposit? And then hopefully growing its grade too, right? Oh, well, first of all, uh, going back, uh, it's uh, listed as a porphyry by the old geologists. And it's really not a porphyry. It's something very different. And mm -hmm. that opens it up. Uh, we are, are trying to understand the system. We can get into that geology. 
But uh, uh, the reason that we can improve on the historic grades is uh, several fold. The first one is that uh, the historic drilling was primarily done by a rotary drill. And uh, rotary drills, as you may or may not know, uh, have a tendency to start losing gold that settles back down into the hole as you're drilling, especially when you have a high groundwater flow. And uh, it, in all the drilling, including ours, we hit a strong uh, water flow at about 100 meters. So that was the first part. The, the, the next part is that the rotary drilling for the most of the drilling only reached about 90 meters before they were uh, ran out of drill capacity. So uh, we have uh, two different uh, ways of improving this now by going deeper and by using better drilling. Our RC program that we did in the fall uh, and uh, early, late summer of last year uh, went deeper uh, and we had overall higher grades, I think in part because of the drilling method being a better method for uh, capturing the gold but also because we found that the mineralization does go beyond that 90 meter estimate that uh, was used for most of the drilling in the past. Uh, our core hole right now, uh, just to follow one more time on why this thing is looking better, it went to 1140 feet or uh, 347 meters, and it was mineralized down to the bottom. Uh, and uh, we had, uh, we proved up our high-grade theorized zone below the previous drilling, I believe, uh, in that drilling. We'll see when the assays come back, but uh, everything indicates uh, to the fact that the mineralization is very, very strong below 100 meters. Mm -hmm. the, the next reason that we can expand this deposit a whole lot more is that uh, we have done a detailed geology on it now. We've run IP on it. And the area burned in a uh, range fire last summer, which exposed the surface for the first time in a long, long time. And uh, we are able to pick up additional structures and areas of mineralization with our mapping now with the exposed ground that shows us uh, that our ideas that this zone that had the historic 2 million ounce figure is one of possibly three or four zones at least. And uh, we have found indications of the second zone pretty strongly now, and I think possibly the third zone. Uh, an another reason that we can expand this is hole four uh, from our RC last year. Uh, we drilled that hole to try to uh, uh, find out the continuity of this half gram mineralization that uh, is typical of Nevada and most of the open pit mines that are operating in the world today. Uh, what we found is, yes, we had that half gram mineralization, but the last 32 meters of that drill hole went four grams uh, per ton and ended in four grams per ton. Now we have a better feel for why that was. It, it appears that it's starting to go into the next zone that we had postulated uh, to uh, be a, a repeat of, of the first area that's been drilled extensively. So wh why is that? Is that all coming out of your uh, out of your head type of thing, or is it like why did the previous operators not see the same thing that you're seeing and do the same thing that you're hoping to do here? Uh, well, uh, one of the uh, reasons is I think they got fixated on this uh, copper porphyry idea, which was popular way back then. Uh, and to be blunt, I, I, I think uh, we know more geology these days than what they, they did at that time, uh, and uh, I, I had a lot of experience in it. Once you recognize it's not a porphyry, now you're not limited to looking for a capping gold system around the copper, uh, a, a porphyry system. It, it's not there. <laughs> and uh, this is actually a, an interesting geological situation that I think opens it up dramatically to expansion. Hmm. And that's something uh, I hope we'll talk about as well, because you call it a, a low temperature um system so we'll get to what it is if it's not a porphyry but let's just just for a second to touch upon that first drill hole that you drilled here so that's the first diamond hole of this program w where was it relative to a historic hole like is it is it a twinned hole is it, is it close to another one where is it uh, okay what we did on that hole is we wanted to uh i'll back up to our last year's drilling and that'll explain why we're uh, we chose the site we did last year when we drilled our hole seven it was uh, aimed toward the northwest, and the reason it was aimed that direction 
was we had already identified that uh, in a exposure, the only exposure of any consequence on the property that is an artificially created exposure uh, because it was uh, caused by the uh, plaster water that was brought in by the plaster miners uh, by ditching from a long distance uh, into there and they cut into the hill that uh, is now the center of all this drilling. When they cut into the hill, they were recovering gold even in the diorite bedrock, which was very intriguing to all of us and to them. And uh, when the geologists came in later, they sampled that outcrop. They, they found the gold in the, the, the diorite, and that's where they started drilling. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a process that has uh, developed over uh, several rounds of exploration and it's continuing to expand. I think our knowledge of the geology now is uh, far better. This is an area, I'll, I'll digress for a second. This is an area where uh, there was under thrusting, you know, plate tectonics where one plate comes against another and pushes in uh, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, under thrust uh, in the Mesozoic. Uh, what that uh, under thrusting was accompanied by was an intrusion of diorite that is very typical in the situation that comes up along the under thrust. So it's not a normal diorite body. It's not a normal thrust fault situation. And I think those are factors that are going to help us expand this property pretty dramatically. None of that was recognized by the early geologists. Well, now that you recognize it, um, what is your sort of thesis here? So what is the significance of finding gold at these different depths that you reported, 30 meters, 108 meters, 160 meters, compared to other uh, deposits in the region, or maybe compared to other deposits that you have in mind that you're looking for? Well, actually, there are. there's only one other deposit that's been identified in the region, and that was Paramount's uh, Grassy Mountain deposit, which is about 40 miles in a straight line away. And uh, uh, this area has not been looked at uh, by a modern day geologist at all uh, for a long, long time. In fact, I'm an Oregon geologist and I didn't even know about this project until it was brought to our attention by uh, Jerry Boffman of, uh, of Gold Royalty Corporation who introduced us uh, to it. And uh, he had found it in the old records because that's his job. He digs around, finds these things and then puts them in good hands. Uh, because gold royalty specializes in getting the royalty off of that property as it develops. Yes, and, st and still, I mean, that's, I have a question about that as well, but uh, now that you have a better understanding, you said, about this system, as far as you know right now, because you're still early in this, in your um, exploration phase, I think, what is your thesis here? So is there any analogy you can make uh, to another deposit that I, you have in mind? Like that's something that I think... We're looking at here or is it still so unknown that you cannot even say that well uh, I, I was uh, trying to evade that question a little bit <laughs> but uh, uh, because what we have is leapfrog models and the leapfrog models uh, are even being modified by our detailed surface mapping we just completed but uh, the basic structure that we see now is you have uh, a uh, Sheet, uh, a sheet like diorite body as uh, is caused by the subduction zone model that we're talking about. Uh, we have it uh, disrupted by a dominant northeast trending fault pattern, uh, which is also accompanied by a uh, secondary northwest trending uh, folding pattern. And the mineralization appears to have come in probably along the, the flat lying structure, you know, the old subduction zone fault, come up, this is my speculation uh, right now, come up along the fault fractures and not only uh, concentrated strong mineralization in, in those uh, fractures, but also it's spread out into the country rock. And our core really showed me some very interesting things that uh, we're still puzzling about, but they're very positive. We found that the VG that uh, we reported, uh, the visible gold, uh, was actually within the diorite. And it was in halos around uh, uh, iron-rich minerals. And it was in, uh, in uh, coatings around the historic 
pyrite that was in the the diorite. So what we have is a very late stage a gold entry into the diorite. And I'm saying it's lower temperature because there are actually locally voids in the, the uh, uh, rock that uh, are incompletely filled. And uh, we see a retrograde. I'll get a little technical here. We see retrograde alteration of the diorite uh, toward green schist. Uh, so uh, it is a low temperature uh, uh, gold system that came in possibly millions of years after the diorite was in place. Very likely, in my opinion, a tertiary gold system imposed on a Mesozoic uh, structural system, and it was all chopped up by based on the range faulting at the same time. Hmm. I'll pretend that I know what you just said here and ask one of the <laughs> Sorry questions. Sorry about that. Time. But uh, <laughs> what's no? I I think you're you're touching up on important stuff here. I'm trying to kind of simplify it. Maybe take it from what you wrote in this news release, uh, which is that the mineralization doesn't seem to be concentrated to the breccia zone, which is what you had initially thought before. So how are you interpreting the structural controls? Let's take it from, from kind of the, the higher levels of, on the structural controls, specifically on the higher grade, well, potentially higher grade here. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah. That's actually a, a really uh, intriguing situation. When we were getting this higher grade earlier, we thought that has to be with some kind of a, a diatreme or volcanic breccia situation. What we found in our core is no, it's actually gold scattered within the diorite. And uh, it, it, it is a, a, a situation where the gold dropped out, where the conditions, the chemical conditions for the gold dropping out were favorable, which is around those uh, uh, iron rich minerals I was talking about and around the pyrite uh, inclusions. That's why the gold coats the pyrite, goes those. Uh, uh, mafic minerals and also it uh, turns out that this is a wonderful thing for us in two aspects first of all the system expands uh, we're not limited by any kind of a breccia zone it's expanded and where we uh, have indications that we are following up on that it's expanded across a much larger area than had been recognized before uh, and that's a, a very good thing the other thing that this has done for us is it's made us understand why the metallurgy on this, you know, the gold recoverability on this is so extremely good. It's be, uh, so extremely good because the gold came in later. It was not encapsulated. That means absorbed in, and locked up in the pyrite. It was not it, absorbed in any kind of a silica, a quartz uh, encapsulation. It's exposed to either solution uh, mining, like uh, uh the, the Nevada mines, or it could even be uh, uh, a very good candidate for recovery by uh, a gravity on the front end, followed by flotation process on the back end, which means excellent recoveries in any way you want to attack it based on the data we've gotten from our testing and from historic testing. Um, I listen a lot to uh, to exploration stories. Uh, I, I can recognize that you are a geologist and, and and very very focused on it um so far that i cannot follow everything but i still like it <laughs> yeah and sorry about because, that i can simplify no, no, it but... no <laughs> a moment I, I i like it because um the answer and the way you answer also gives a bit of the answer to me already in terms of you trying to understand the system rather than just promote something to us but let me just ask this question for the moment like um you have this hole that that's going quite deep i think you mentioned uh 300 meters and let's just assume for the moment that that comes back, if it comes back with good grades and maybe tell us what is good grade here? I mean, previous holes, I've seen some very high grade holes, but also some, well, one, one, one and a half grams over long intercepts, which could still be considered high grade, I think. And what would that mean to your program? So what is the next step? If this hole confirms your thesis and gives you the grades that are confirming economic potential, let's just say with as much as one holder can do that, uh, what would be the next step? Are you going to step out from this hole? Um, are you going even deeper? Tell us a little bit what you're planning to do. Okay. Uh, first of all, on uh, the area where the first hole was, uh, which was trying to find the uh, limits of this uh, multigram area that we picked up in uh, the holes last year. Uh, we uh, now have established, A, it goes a lot deeper, that high-grade system, I think. We are waiting for assays, but I think we're going to see some numbers that are, are very attractive 
uh, much past that 100 meter level. Our second hole uh, that we are drilling at now, actually it's our third because uh, we had a hole problem and so we're re-drilling it, um, is testing that zone we hit in hole four. Hole four, uh, just for your uh, background, is angled completely differently from hole seven. It was angled away from that area. The uh, uh, hole was sputted or started about 200, 250 meters away from that area. And uh, yet the bottom of that hole ran four grams uh, for 32 meters, as I mentioned. Uh, where we need to understand what's going on out there. How big is that zone? What uh, what does it look like in detail? That's why we're drilling this next hole. After that, uh, what we really need to focus on now is a, an infill and testing pattern of new structural uh, targets we have in the area that I think are going to repeat that first area and do a lot of infill drilling to start establishing a block uh, resource, which we we don't have a block resource by uh, 43101 standards at this point. I'm not anxious to uh, create that early because uh, that uh, original 2 million ounce estimate was non-compliant and I don't want to lock people's thinking into that size because I think it's going to grow dramatically both down infill and outward. So uh, our next phase is a, a significant step out and infill program of our seed drilling after we've drilled this hole that uh, is going to find out what the heck was that four gram zone looking like and then how far does it go? We also don't know whether that four gram uh, hole is tied in to the area that the first hole uh, was in or if it's a new area, uh, I'm guessing it may connect uh, based on some limited information and speculation, which means that uh, we have an extensive area of multigram that uh, is still unlimited. Hmm. Uh, let's talk a little bit about why you think that is and, and roll a little bit back, if you will, here for a second, because it's interesting that the news release mentioned a low temperature mineralizing event, as I mentioned at the beginning. What is that telling you about the strength of the mineralizing event, as well as this might be a good point to talk about the host rock and how easy that host rock would have been to mineralize so that you can make the claim of, oh, I think it's going to get bigger. Well, I, I actually, uh, you hit an interesting question. And this is uh, geologic thinking right now. What we have here, and I've never seen this before, is a uh, diorite body that has gold scattered throughout it in very attractive uh, amounts. I've never seen that before. And I've looked at properties on three continents. Uh, what it, it tells us is that we have a system that was so strong uh, so, uh, that it penetrated the diorite and formed halos around uh, reducing it, it, you know, uh, chemically uh, 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 reducing environments where the gold dropped out around the pyrite and around the uh, 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 pyroxene and other crystals in there. It also was strong enough to start altering, metamorphically altering those minerals into lower temperature mineral assemblages. So a uh, very strong system. Uh, by the way, one of the side notes on this is our IP, our uh, survey that we did, showed a spectacular target to our west that is completely untested. Uh, what it has is a, a boundary between our diorite and the black shale. Uh, as you may or may not know, black shale is a wonderful reducing environment. And uh, so that target needs to be tested because here we have fluids that we're depositing strong gold in the diorite uh, around pyrite and uh, mafic minerals. And uh, we have uh, the mother load of, uh, of reduction environment with that black shale. We need to test that target. It's untested. Hmm. What does that mean? You mentioned on the, you touched upon on the metallurgy here for a second. What does that mean for the predicted metallurgical behavior of the potential here? Oh, that's one of the things. Normally, as you guys know, uh, when you have a big open pit mine and you do heat bleaching in places like Nevada, uh, uh, the normal recovery rate can be from the mid 60s to the mid 70s percent. Uh, and uh, uh, that's considered good. 
what we had uh, in the earlier testing that really puzzled me. I mean, it really puzzled me. That's why one of the reasons why when we started uh, doing our own uh, drilling last year, we sent bulk samples off to Dawson Metallurgical for metallurgy testing. Uh, they, we ended up uh, with, uh, first of all, the first hole, because we were using gravity and flotation, had not very good recoveries. It would work well in cyanide recovery based on historic testing. But the other holes had an average of 88% recovery of the gold without optimization. As the lab told us, we haven't even begun to optimize. Uh, they had 88% recovery, even more to the point, holes 7 and 11, which were our strong uh, you know, 3 gram holes, had a mid 90s percent recoveries. Uh, and the recovery was simply by gravity and by flotation. And I don't know if people are familiar with what flotation is, but flotation is basically a, a very, uh, a very non, uh, uh, I should non hazardous, <laughs> simple method of uh, creating uh, basically soap bubbles in a froth into the material. And what the bubbles do is they attach to uh, any kind of sulfide or gold. And uh, that comes out in the froth and goes over a little skim mm. on the edge of the vat into the good stuff. And the waste product stays in uh, and goes out the, uh, the bottom into the bad stuff. Uh, it, it, that's a very simple explanation, but that's the principle. And uh, that recovery is very inexpensive, very effective, and it worked wonderfully on this. If you look at the historical data of those um, 242 holes, how consistent is the composition of the mineralogy and how consistent is the alteration? Because to do flotation, you do need it to be consistent along the strike. Yeah, we don't have uh, much data on uh, what the metallurgy of those, uh, what data we do have is it shows it's similar. But on our outcrop work, uh, our geologist work, uh, we see the similar type of mineralization the similar type of, uh, and this is important, the similar type of historic plaster mining of the surface. The plaster mining on this uh, area that was done in the mid 1870s uh, was uh, done uh, uh, on uh, getting gold recovery out of the underlying bedrock. There, there's no transported uh, plaster gold in this area. So what we're seeing is that they did historic plaster recovery way away from our drilling right now on the hillsides. So uh, the, I, I'm guessing indirectly that the mineralogy is going to remain the same. Uh, our mapping showed that the diorite is consistent and our, our mapping has shown some strong alteration zones that we need to follow up on. And, uh, uh, and a couple of those zones are at least as good as the one we're on now. Are they correspondent with the IP chargeability anomalies that you ran? And also, this might be a good point for you to talk to me about why even do IP to begin with? Well, I wasn't excited about doing IP uh, because IP has never been that effective on Nevada type deposits. Uh, but uh, we, we did it anyway. And uh, uh, what we did find out is that... Uh, there are areas uh, in the IP. Well, first of all, what the IP did that was a wonderful thing is it helped us identify these main fault structures, verified our, our leapfrog model on uh, the, especially the northeast structure that uh, is a, a very important structure. Uh, but uh, uh, overall, uh, the IP uh, showed us areas of a greater resistivity. And uh, those are areas associated with the current drilling. And it also showed that whopping air, a target area on the, the edge of the uh, black shale that we have yet to test. So uh, IP, uh, it's, it's interesting, not indicative is the best way to, to say that. Our mapping is far more important. The historic drilling is far more important. I mean, historic drilling, uh, I heard you say in a previous interview that there was another major company or uh, maybe a mid-tier, I'm not sure what you said there, that was looking at this property, but that Providence got the, the preference for this option agreement. That's one. And two is uh, the property is in a region without many mines, as you said. So what do you think is the threshold? What do you need to find to make this interesting for a major or to a mid-tier? 
I think it's already becoming interesting for uh, majors. Uh, one major said, uh, when you have the core, let's talk. So uh, we, uh, I think we will be on the threshold uh, of uh, discussing with majors here shortly. And it's going to be our decision on what's the best for the company. Because if the shareholders can get more value by uh, advancing this project further uh, before we make any kind of a deal, then that's the way we'll go. So uh, to answer your question, uh, they're already interested. The only concern uh, that they might have is the fact that it's a new area of exploration, but that new area of exploration is going to be actually a, a, a good thing for us because uh, what we're seeing is Nevada type geology. We're seeing uh, a, a major area for new discovery, and we are the second in, in uh, the uh, pike right now, I think, after Paramount's Grassy Mountain. And I think our system is uh, possible. Uh, I, uh, this is uh, just my own opinion. I think it's stronger. It's definitely uh, over a much larger area than what we have currently drilled right now. So, uh, uh, yes, majors will be interested. They like size. They need those new re reserves. Uh, we have everything that I think is going to make us very attractive. And what about the state? Oregon, Oregon, uh, I heard about, you know, the, the east and western side are different in terms of permitting or maybe uh, people's perce perception of mining. Is that true? Uh, very much so. Uh, in fact, uh, it is kind of a funny story, but... Uh, uh, I was uh, sitting there quietly and I got a phone call from uh, an old friend who I'd helped out. He happened to be the regulator for Eastern Oregon for Dog Yammy, the, the state's uh, resource uh, department. And he said, well, why aren't you looking in Oregon? And, and I said, well, because you know why. You can't do anything in Oregon. He said, well, that's changed. And of course, I, I didn't really believe him, but I, I started doing my own checking. And uh, now, by the way, we have Andy Bentz on our advisory board, who was one of the advisors for getting Paramount through that system. But anyway, what's happened is that Oregon has made the recognition, first of all, that Eastern Oregon is a completely different continent from Western Oregon. And uh, it's unpopulated, it's desert, it's conservative, it's pro-mining. Uh, in or, uh, uh, that recognition, uh, even the governor and the state officials have recognized that if a properly uh, developed gold mine as a la Nevada or Idaho is uh, permitted and developed in Eastern Oregon, it'll be a major economic boom. Uh, Eastern Oregon is uh, uh, economically deprived compared to Western Oregon. So uh, they have cattle grazing and not much else. So this would be a major shot in, in the arm for their situation. So to answer the question, uh, Eastern Oregon, uh, you have uh, pro-development, you have support from the government, Dogami went to the extent that they hired a, uh, a state geologist who is the, uh, the supreme authority uh, in Dogami uh, from industry, and he hired two geologists from industry to streamline the process. Uh, so they're getting a whole lot better on their permitting. Uh, to make that point, uh, when we applied for our first drilling before all this had happened, they only hired the state geologists, not the two guys from industry. Uh, it took us uh, 18 months to get our drill permit. Our second uh, round took us two weeks uh, because uh, they are recognizing the system. They're comfortable, and we've made friends with them. Uh, they, they recognize that we're the real deal, and uh, uh, we are cooperating very well. Mm. So but just to, to clarify, and, and I might have missed this, but is this – BLM land, like if you wanted to drill something else, you have to permit a couple of more pads or like, how was that going to work? Uh, it's BLM land and the BLM was easy to permit. Uh, it took us two weeks uh, to permit the BLM on the first round and we've extended the permits. Uh, so uh, it, it is BLM land. Our, our currently known deposit is on BLM land. Our step out targets that we've identified that we're working on are BLM land. Uh, we have about 1140 acres right now of, uh, of BLM land, but uh, what uh, we're going to do uh, also, and we're in the middle of it, is even expanding further to theoretical targets in the future, and we're in those discussions. But mm. uh, right now, we have 
uh, we have under our control the known resource and the known step out target area. So far, you, you've done a, a good job of explaining a lot of the unknowns. Let's maybe summarize that list of, of unanswered questions, if you will. What's the most pressing unanswered question for you? You hang up, you know, you hang up the Zoom meeting here and you go answer it. What's the first question you go answering? Hmm. Uh, well, actually, my uh, first uh, my first question is why are we so undervalued <laughs> when we have such a, an incredible uh, project? And I think it's the fact that we came in and uh, did our technical work first, and uh, we only recently started getting uh, a, a program to draw attention to what we have. So that's why our stock took off so well, uh, because we finally have eyes on us. We did not have that before. When we uh, put out the news releases in the fall, we were expecting something. Nothing happened because nobody had heard about us. Nobody was paying attention. Hmm. What, so what? The, I don't really have a most pressing uh, uh, concern that I haven't answered. We have a, a, a great deposit. It has great geology, great mineralogy. Uh, it has growth potential downward, infill and outward, uh, and uh, we're uh, extremely undervalued. Hmm. Well, I do appreciate a good promotional spin. You do have an answer. Uh, question. And oh, that is, have... it's, it's a real promotional spin because that's the reality. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's why I do appreciate it. But, you, well, you do have, I mean, you, you just mentioned you want to do more RC drilling. Um, th there's a couple of things to figure out. What's the What's the first thing that you think? adds the most value to the story here when answered like well, what's what's the biggest geological unknown that you have now well i want to have verification of our step out target areas and uh, those are are very real on the surface They're, they uh, for instance our soil geochemistry uh, that we didn't do the historic people did way back when showed two areas with strong soil anomalies there neither one of them is in our drill area so we want to go out and uh, improve the deposit by finding out what the heck is that the four uh, grams per ton zone doing in hole four, because on the surface, it looks like it's going to uh, take off and grow uh, pretty strongly. So we want to do step out drilling to verify those. We want to do step out drilling. Uh, we found two adits that were never exposed before that were exposed by the fire that happened that are in strongly mineralized ground, uh, even further north of that uh, whole four zone. And uh, we don't know what's between four and that uh, step out zone because it's all covered by dirt, <laughs> by colluvium. Uh, so uh, I think our best way to expand this deposit is uh, the old, unfortunately, uh, the, the Trump syndrome, drill baby drill. <laughs> so, so uh, we are going to be doing step out drilling and expansion and more detailed work and, and sampling. Mm. When are you going to have that? And w when are you going to do that work? When are you going to have the results back? When are we going to have those answers? Okay, we've already started that work. And uh, we're going to, uh, we have uh, our, uh, we're hoping to have our drill results, which are in the hands of the lab, as you know how it goes, uh, that are before the end of November. Uh, we're hoping that's uh, uh, dependent on the lab. Uh, uh, we are uh, definitely going to have an update uh, news release coming up uh, here uh, in the near future just uh, to say that uh, we are, you know, what we're doing on our core drilling right now. Uh, uh, we are going to uh, start focusing in the, the winter on putting out a detailed plan for our RC drilling that is coming up. And I think that we're going to have continued uh, improvement in uh, visibility with the results of that RC program, which I think are going to be very strong. So Can I'm not you, sure uh... I answered your question. It's a good answer. The end of November uh, target there was a good answer, but Luke wants to add, uh, Luke wants to ask something. I think. Yeah, yeah. One, one more about the drilling. Uh, <clears throat> the um, what can you drill all year round, or do you have certain limitations? Do I only drill which? 
I'm sorry. Okay, can understand. you drill? Can you drill uh, all year round, or can, do you have? Oh, okay, you yeah. Cannot drill? You actually can. The reason that I want to take the break is uh, twofold. First of all, I want to digest the information we're gathering uh, so that we uh, plan the right program uh, because it's a uh, it's a work in progress on that. But the other uh, reason is that uh, in the winter, they get a little bit of snow, but more importantly, not much. Uh, you can drill year round if it's a, an advanced project. But the other reason is that the roads to the site get muddy and slippery in the winter. So it causes a, a little more difficulty getting to and from site. Otherwise you can drill on site when you get there. Uh, so short answer, uh, we can drill year round. Uh, we prefer the break now to have uh, just the right program in place and uh, to avoid those two or three slippery months and then back to work. So two or three months means uh, early next year you would resume? Uh, as soon as uh, it dries out, exactly. Yeah. In terms of finance, I mean, you just financed uh, uh, 1.4 million, I think. Or was it a bit more? I think uh, that's one for Rob. I'm not going to mistake by uh, making a guess, but it's in that ballpark. Yes. All right. And are you? Can you say anything about uh, how how long you're financed for? Can you continue this work early next year with this program? Can, can you do a similar program next year with the current financing, or do you need a financing to continue? I, we're going to need a, a, another financing, and uh, we were overfinanced on this one. We had a lot of people wanting to put money in, and uh, we had to turn them away, which uh, you hate to do, but we needed to do, because I think uh, with when we get uh, the results that we expect on our, our core program, uh, we can uh, refinance at a higher level. And who are your shareholders right now? Is there any bigger party or is it mostly retail owned? Uh, it's uh, I, uh, mostly retail owned for the moment. Uh, uh, we we have a conversation uh, coming up with a major that might change that. But uh, right now it's mostly retail. What's the ideal, in your mind, sort of the ideal philosophy about getting a major in? Would you prefer to keep a major below 10% for control reasons? Would you be happy to have them at 20%? Uh, do you want to do a joint venture on this project or not, not at all now that you know that you have something? I mean, what's your philosophy about owning this project? In the That's going to have people? to be a group board uh, decision because sure. we want to do whatever is the, the, the best for uh, the shareholders, including us, uh, uh, to maximize value and uh, that's not an easy question to answer until we uh, get a, a little bit better feel for what is the best strategy. Because I think uh, the value of this company is uh, quite a few times its share price. You just mentioned yourself as part of the part of the shareholders. Insider ownership here is at around six, seven, eight percent, I believe, somewhere in that range. Now fully diluted uh, after the um, after the recent raise. Is there a strategy in place to increase insider ownership either through private placements or through buying in the open market? And, and talk to me if any insiders participated in this private placement. Uh, we uh, we haven't uh, discussed that uh, right now. But uh, once again, uh, none of us is switching gears on that. None of us is planning to sell for a long time. <laughs> that's, that's part A. Part B is... Uh, uh, that uh, we also don't want to take advantage of our positions to uh, try to do anything, uh, you know, uh, uh, unusual. So we are going to, uh, I think, mostly remain pat with our the current ownership of, of shares in the company. I also noticed that you're, and this might be a question for Rob. Uh, he he hasn't been. That was a question for Rob. The other one too. Okay. <laughs> I, um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I hope. Well, maybe he can join us in a in, at a later date. But I noticed that your average monthly burn rate for non exploration activities was rather low over the last reported six months. It was sitting at around thirty five thousand dollars again on a, on an average monthly basis. You, how, is that something that you guys have discussed, like growing the team, getting a bigger office, increasing salaries? Like, is this burn rate going to grow, or is this where it's going to stay? Uh, it. Uh... It will uh, grow on one thing. We have uh, help coming in uh, on the marketing right now who is setting up, uh, you know, they have been uh, introducing us to a much larger audience. So, uh, but uh, uh, that's uh, one aspect uh, of an increased burn rate. Uh, that's right now, as you probably read, uh, 20000 a month, but they've more than earned that money. Uh, and uh, it, it is 
uh, uh, terminatable uh, with 30 days notice at any point where it doesn't continue to be an advantage uh, to us. But as far as our own salaries, we have taken minimal salaries, many months, no salaries, because we wanted to make sure that our drill uh, is covered. Uh, and uh, we don't plan to change that philosophy by trying to uh, get the salaries that I used to have and Rob used to have, uh, because we're counting on making our money on a, a value of the company. Mm. That is actually part of the reason of why I suppose the burn rate was low is so salaries, uh, but there's just not a lot of marketing. But talk to me about that. I mean, what the contract that you signed, what are you hoping to get out of it? What are your marketing objectives? Um, who are you targeting? Is it more European? Is it more uh, professional investors? Like, what, what What is this marketing program going to do for current okay, it, It's already sure? been underway, and that's the reason you saw the, the doubling, uh, maybe almost tripling of the share price was because of, we have a much bigger audience now. Uh, we've been introduced to uh, brokers and uh, 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 key investors in uh, in mining, and uh, we have had a very, very warm reception across the board because they take a look at what we have, and, and uh, it, you don't see that. And I don't know of any other majors. Uh, there must be some, but I haven't seen any other majors that have quite the projects that we do right now for as small a company as we are. Uh, with with the focus right now on El Dorado projects, um, what about the other projects that you have in the company? Are you going to do uh, any work are, there, or is that now um, on the uh, back burner? Uh, we are uh, actually uh, inviting uh, a possible joint venture partner on White Rock. White Rock uh, is a, a, a solid Nevada project. Uh, it, I, it has a hundred drill holes. We build thirty five of them. It's completely open. It doesn't have the spectacular initial grades that we've found in El Dorado, which is why we're focusing on El Dorado because uh, it, it's it's a unusual deposit. But uh, for a good Nevada bulk tonnage uh, target, I think White Rock is exceptional. It has a lot of the earmarks uh, of uh, the Black Pine Mine uh, of Liberty Gold. It's in the same geology, same structural setting, uh, same type of mineralization. So uh, anyway, that one is open for a joint venture, or if we get uh, funded so strongly, we can look at funding both projects at the same time. Right now, any funding that comes in is gonna go into advancing El Dorado. Uh, we have another little project out there that is uh, a raw exploration property uh, uh, east of Tonopah called uh, Silver Bow, and that one has some interest. And we, we, I personally love that project as a uh, project that I think is going to take off, but we can't waste any time and money on it at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's just sitting. Uh, we we control this, so we're just leaving it in our back pocket. We have made our last payments on uh, White Rock right now uh, to a Gold Royalty Corporation, so we also own that one in-house. Good. Uh, I think we've covered a lot here. Um, maybe we should um, you know, do an, another conversation later down the road. I'm sure people watching this will also have follow-up questions. You're expecting assay soon, so there's going to be a lot to talk, talk about. Um, what are we forgetting to ask you, though? What do you think is another important aspect of the story that we failed to cover here just before we close it off? Mm. I think you guys have done a wonderful job of covering the key points. Uh, I, I can't think of anything critical because uh, we've covered uh, the quality of the property, our, uh, our small company situation, low burn rate. Uh, no, I think you've done a wonderful job. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and hopefully we can do this again soon. Good. Thank you. All right. Moving on, I'm talking to Destin Perry of Kingfisher Metals. Once again, that's a copper and gold exploration company with assets in BC, and it's listed as KFR on the TSX Ventures Exchange in Canada, where an average of about 50,000 shares trade each day. And I also see a 52-week high of $0.35 cents and a 52-week low of $0.07. Cents. With a six and a half million dollar market cap and forty three million shares outstanding today, this is a fifteen cent stock. But we're not talking about Kingfisher as much today because Dustin and I already did a deep dive on the company a couple of months ago, and we actually did a deep dive on Dustin himself, his past mistakes, successes, and all everything in between. And there's even a playlist on the channel where you can watch all Kingfisher related videos that I've done so far, and all the ones that I will be doing in the future because there is a um. Uh, 
you know, a Kingfisher update, if you will, coming in a not too distant future. As I think there are also some assays to. But again, today we're actually talking about British Columbia as a mineral exploration jurisdiction, hopefully in a way that hasn't been covered before from kind of head to toe, because apparently BC is changing. At least that's what veteran prospector, as he likes to call himself, Bernie Kreft told uh, Luke and I in a previous episode a, a couple of months ago. And apparently it's not um, it's not necessarily changing for the better, or at least not all aspects of it are, although some, some things appear to be getting better. So I hope we'll get to the bottom of all that here today, Dustin. But let's maybe kick it off with a, kick it off kind of lightly, if you will, by talking about the opportunity as a whole like why would i even consider bc today instead of uh, another jurisdiction within or even outside of canada yeah well it's opportunity uh the opportunity in bc is amazing you know the largest undeveloped gold system in the world at ksm bruce mm -hmm. jack's one of the highest grade operating mines in the world i i believe galore creek fits on the top uh 10 i think ksm actually and galore creek are on the top 10 undeveloped copper assets when you look at that component Red Chris is, you know, one of the nicest copper gold porphyries out there. It had intercepts of about a kilometer of a, of a percent copper. Uh, so, you know, the, the opportunity is amazing. And it's not just that in BC. We've also got BMS potential with things like SK Creek. Uh, uh, we've got, uh, well, there was the, the massive Sullivan mine, massive lead zinc uh, silver mine. Uh, but then, and then also there's the metallurgical coal side of things. So BC is very resource rich and that's just the mining side. You know, we've also got fisheries, which are dwindling and forestry, which isn't doing as well, but BC is a resource-based economy and mining uh, provides about a third of the BC economy. So it, it, it really is a, a resource rich place and there's still yet to be, uh, you know, there's a lot of exploration that, that can be done in areas that, you know, it's is untapped still, I would say. Hmm. Uh, but in addition to that, there are uh, a lot of issues in BC, which I'm sure we'll get into here, uh, in relation to the complexities of permitting, which uh, I think one figure that I can I can provide you with that, that might be good to bring up here would be uh, just a map of the, the diversity of Indigenous peoples in BC versus elsewhere in North America. It's incredibly complex in BC, which means there's so many overlapping uh, interests, which make decision making difficult. Uh, so that is a layer of, of BC that that is challenging, uh, but overall, you know, we're not in uh, we're not in somewhere in say Latin America where you might get a nationalized uh, mining does you know belong in BC and it's an important part of the economy and uh, the current the current election which isn't settled quite yet it might be by the time this video goes out it clearly showed that the you know half of bc was not happy with the direction it was going so regardless of the outcome i think more attention will have to be put on resource development in bc uh, because rural bc has spoken <laughs> well, well can you expand a little bit more in that political situation there because that's what i mentioned at the beginning like that seems to be getting more challenging but wh where where does it end like how far could this thing go well, one of the current issues in British Columbia uh, is the the attempt to modernize the the Tenure Act, uh, which one of the angles is that it is not, you know, and the BC courts have said that it is not respecting uh, UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights. I believe I got that right. <laughs> um, so they're saying, and and that really comes back to consent. Uh, on on areas, so that will have implications, and there's some uncertainty right now. AMEBC has commented on that, um, and then various Indigenous leaders have commented on that, and that's you know that's ongoing. Uh, nothing has has been settled yet on that, but one thing uh, that's been advocated for is requiring consent prior to staking, and that does have issues uh, in that. You know, if you go into an area and you have to get consent, you've actually signaled your interest in an area, which is basically signaling that you might have some confidential information of, of an area's prospectivity and you're giving it over to a group and you're, you know, it's, it's like, how do, you, how do you manage that? Mm. Do you have a CA in place? <laughs> um, it's, it's a pretty complicated issue that I don't have an answer for. Um, you know, policy isn't my, isn't my expertise um and 
I am also not Indigenous, so I can't speak for Indigenous groups on this matter. Uh, I can just look at it as, an, as, a, as a participant and also as an observer and a British Columbian and uh, recognize that there does need to be some change. Uh, it needs to be modernized. It's an old act that dates back to you know the beginning of BC, uh, but it also needs to respect everybody's interests. So mm-hmm. it's there, there is uncertainty in that regard. And um, we've experienced some uncertainty that I can get into on one, one of our projects. Uh, and you know, permitting in itself is a pretty onerous, or, or maybe not too onerous, but it's, it's, it takes a long time to get a permit for exploration in BC. And that time frame varies drastically across the province, depending on which mines office you're mm-hmm. permitting out of, but also depending on which uh, Indigenous groups you're consulting with. Um, it, it, there's there's a huge difference between that. And even within some groups, tenures, there could be different areas that are going to be more complicated. Mm. Uh, I've got an example of that within Taltan territory, which is a, a relatively straightforward place to work. Um, so there, there's a fair bit to unpack here. <laughs> there is, but that's exactly where I want to take this. I want to go deeper on uh, permitting because that's i'm just talking off the top of my head here but but based on what you're saying i have a feeling that that what i'm thinking might be right but it feels like i've seen many permit delays even in one of the companies that are that i'm in over the last couple of years and it, it almost seems like it's getting worse exactly because you have to deal with those two structures like it's 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 government but then there's also uh within first nations not all of them are as business friendly and all that and we can touch upon that later on as well but Yes, talk, talk to me about from from your perspective. W- what are you seeing? W- what's kind of an average timeline that you can hope? And also the different zones that you said, like what what is a better zone of BC to be operating in relative, you know, for for permitting? Well, okay, okay here's an example. Uh, the Smithers Mines Office is what permits the Golden Triangle, which is definitely sees the bulk of exploration work in BC, hmm. and that office is notorious for for how long it takes to permit and that i think partially relates to a staffing issue uh but it also relates to the complexity of that area like within that area it, it includes the golden triangle which is just a, a basically a, a line on it or a triangle on a map but it also includes areas outside of it um and the heart of the golden triangle is predominantly taltan and nishka territory and those two indigenous groups have uh, long histories of mining. They've been involved with modern mines, but then the Taltan have been mining since the beginning of, of, of their history here, basically. Uh, they were mining obsidian, uh, so volcanic glass, and creating tools out of it. And those tools have been traced all up and down the coast of the Pacific, uh, where they were trading with other indigenous peoples. So I think that, I, again, I can't speak on their behalf, but as an outsider, my perception is that that, that, that uh, you know, they understood mining and they've been miners. And then they've seen a lot of economic benefits in that area with, you know, going way back the the Premier Mine and the SNP Mine and then Golden Bear and SK. And then more recently, Bruce Jack and uh, and Redcrest. And, you know, in that process, the, uh, for example, the Taltan have, have done very well with their uh, Taltan Nation, the TNDC, the Taltan Nation Development Corporation, mm-hmm. which... Uh, it's one of, if not the largest, Indigenous-owned businesses in British Columbia. Um, they've, they've done incredibly well uh, with that high degree of organization. Um, and it's, you know, I, I feel like, and it's done a lot for the Taltan people. Um, so that area is complicated and it, it takes, it can take a while, but there's a little more certainty. For us, for example, we've we've taken, it's taken about nine months to get a permit in that area. Uh, we've been through a couple processes there. Uh, so our project actually has three separate permits on it. Uh, part of that is because the, the permitting process began as we started consolidating the area. So, you know, one of them we did basically through its entirety and that took nine months. Other ones were, they were kind of in place and we had to do amendments. Um, and then other areas, uh, you know, there's the Kamloops area. Uh, we permitted our gold range project through there, and that was fairly straightforward, uh, which some people might be surprised about because uh, I would say the mining industry's perception of the, the Chilcotin First Nation uh, is that they're anti-mining uh, based on 
the experience of uh, the prosperity or new prosperity project, uh, the old Fish Lake deposit. Uh, I forget how big that is, probably around 10 million ounce gold porphyry. Um, it's big. Uh, West of Williams Lake. It's a large porphyry. It's a Cretaceous age porphyry. So it's a, I know uh, a few other groups like Sables exploring in that area. We might even have porphyry targets on our gold range project. Um, so that, that area, there's a long, you know, I'm not going to go into why or where Tosico might have misstepped on that and why there might be a anti-colonial sentiment in the area. Uh, there is a long history. Uh, you know, there was a big war with the Chilcotin for, uh, First Nation against, uh, I guess, the BC government a long time ago. And uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of negative history there. So mm -hmm. it's understandable that they might be opposed to uh, to work being done without consent in their area. But uh, one thing that we've always done is uh, we've always advocated for very early consultation and every permit we've applied for, we've shared with Indigenous groups prior to submitting it to the BC government, um, which is partly a, a, you know, trying to build trust, but is also giving them more time uh, to review the file. Because one thing that investors might not be aware of is depending on the Indigenous group you're dealing with, a lot of these different groups have, you know, drastically different uh, degrees of capacity for actually reviewing these agreements, mm -hmm. uh, which can extend the permitting timeline if they don't have a chance. So the, the BC permitting office has people who work in consultation kind of separate from the actual permitting officer. And that's a kind of a process that's going on in the background. Um, so, you know, a wealthier group is able to hire more people. A poor uh, a poor band has less capacity to do that, and if they're flooded with applications in that area, they're going to get swamped. So there's a, a lot of intricacies to this. Yeah, for sure. And one thing that you mentioned there is it, kind of getting me thinking here. But it, do you feel like there's a growing anti mining and therefore by extension anti exploration sentiment among local communities in BC? And then we were generalizing because. BC is big, but do you feel like that there's a, a again a growing negative sentiment against us? I don't think so. Um, sometimes I feel that way, and then you know you you talk to. I'm I'm in a bit of a bubble. I live in the Sea to Sky, uh, north of Vancouver, which which went green, one of the one of the two green ridings. So I'm in a little bit of a bubble uh, here, but. Uh, you know, you go down to the city at a dinner party and you, and you talk to people and people know we need metals for, you know, they might want an EV and they understand that you need metal for it. Uh, they understand we need metal for, you know, copper for electrification. Uh, gold tends to be a bit harder of an argument to make with people, but people also understand that, uh, you know, mining is, is probably, I, I think it is the largest employer of indigenous people in the province. Um, because they're rural jobs and in remote areas where it's predominantly or, or often a majority indigenous population. So I, I don't think it's an anti-mining sentiment. I think what it is, is more of a, of a, like providing more indigenous rights and a reconciliation agenda, which, uh, which complicates things because nothing is going to move quickly if it's in the government's hands. So, so yeah. it, that, I think, I think it's more that. I don't think it's anti-mining. Well, well, Maybe anti-oil and gas, but, but not mining. Anti-what? Anti-oil and gas. I think there, <laughs> there, there is that sentiment. Uh, you know, BC has a lot of LNG, uh, natural gas, and, and uh, there's definitely opposition to that. Right where I live, they're, they're building a, a wood fiber LNG terminal, and there's a lot of local opposition to that. Uh, some of it is unfounded. Uh, some of it seems a little bit hypocritical. Uh, some of it does make sense. So it's a lot of these issues are very complicated. <laughs> Where I'm going with this or why why I'm asking you this, Dustin, is because a, a lot of your guys' strategies are find something that's worthwhile for a major or larger company to, to take over. Do you feel like the complications, so to call it, with First Nations might be pushing away large investments from entering into BC to begin with. And and I suppose I could have, have tried gathering some data here, but again, just off the top of my head, or gut feeling, 
I feel like, for example, we've seen more revenue sharing and benefit agreements where essentially a good chunk of the profitability of mining projects is given to local communities, which, of course, I'm not against if it's actually working and improving those communities, obviously, which then on its own can create tangible benefits for First Nations across the country, but also for mining companies from a labor leadership perspective as well. But do you think further increase in those revenue sharing agreements could result in fewer dollars having the desire to flow into BC? Uh, potentially, uh, but, you know, it's also, it's, it's good to have uh, a piece, of, it's, you know, it's still more profitable to have a piece of something that's going to go ahead than a piece of nothing. Um, so I think, you know, mines are profitable in BC. Uh, there's a lot, there's a bunch of them and more being built. Uh, Blackwater is a good example of a mine currently being built. Um, and I don't, I think the evidence supports that the big companies aren't actually afraid of that. Uh, I think Newmont's entry into BC is a pretty clear indication of that. I've always had this idea that, that part of why they liked the projects in British Columbia, such as Red Chris and Bruce Jack was because of the low carbon impact of them and how it will help their ESG agenda. Uh, you know, like BC, all the mines are running on clean uh, hydroelectric energy, which with very low costs, which is partly part of what drives the mining costs down. So I, and then, you know, Fortescue just moved into BC in a big way that, you know, at an early stage, staking a, a massive claim block that I saw you, you and Craig touched on recently. Uh, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're scared of it. Uh, we've, you know, we're regularly chatting with major mining companies about this. So I, you know, the, the opportunity for large systems is here and, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's still a good area to, to work in. Uh, but, you know, one of the first questions any major is going to ask you is, is like, how are you handling consultation and ESG and, and the, everything that falls under that umbrella? Because it is crucial. So, it, you know, if, if you've done things right, uh, the project can definitely appeal to a, a large major. If you've done things wrong and soured a relationship, uh, a good example of a recent soured relationship would be Banks Island Gold. Uh, hmm. They they really messed up, and I think the BC government also messed up on not providing adequate oversight. Uh, Mount Polly is another example uh, where there was a tailings dam failure, and uh, it sounds like it was a little bit maybe on an engineering firm, a little bit on the company, but also the BC government uh, did not grant them uh a permit to basically to, to for uh, moving tailings and increasing the size of it. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think majors are not scared of here, and I think we'll see more coming in the future. That that you know it might sound weird because we're talking about exploration here, but the reason why I'm asking about major mining companies again because this is potentially your guys's exit strategy here. Is there a lot of uh, unionizing of the labor force in, in for explorers, but then also for miners in BC? Um, I I can't really comment on that. That's not, uh, I, I'm not aware of, I, I don't really know. <laughs> uh, hmm. I, but in the, on the exploration side of things, not nothing that I know of. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. And, and, and I suppose we can talk endlessly about regulations and, and local communities. Uh, but the environment is part of that too. And and the geography of the region can be challenging. So if you look at a map of BC, of the population density, then you see that the no Northern BC, there's basically nobody living there. And, and that's potentially part of it too. But let's kick it off, kick it off maybe with talking about uh, water rights, you know, a very, very important aspect of virtually every every mining and exploration operation out there yet not as well covered or talked about. And in BC specifically, as far as I understand it, water use and treatment is exceptionally highly regulated. How is that impacting your or other exploration campaigns? And yeah, talk to me about water. Yeah, so on an exploration uh, program, so you are using water for drilling um, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. I, I would say it's not that complicated to... To, to deal with that in the permitting process. Uh, you pick your locations, uh, you, you need to use uh, basically a filter on the intake to prevent fish from coming in. Um, you need to use things like siltation fences that would go down slope of a drill site. 
Uh, one thing that has changed in recent times is in the past, you would be required to reseed a drill site when you reclaim it. Uh, they don't do that any longer uh, because you might be bringing in non-indigenous uh, or, no, or you know different species of grass to an area. Uh, one thing they get you to do now is any topsoil you, you remove is to basically stockpile it and then spread it back over the area and let nature do its thing. Um, but the water has not been an issue from an expiration standpoint for us. Uh, but it's definitely a concern. Uh, in, during consultation, Indigenous groups are always asking about that. Um, and from a mining standpoint, I can't touch too much on on, on acquiring those rights. But I do know uh, in the Golden Triangle, specifically the the northern half of it, say, where you get the a lot of these rivers are actually draining through Alaska. I know that uh, Alaskan groups in that transboundary region have have definitely uh, expressed opposition to mining projects. KSM, for example, there's definitely concern there. Um, and it relates to salmon, uh, which is interesting because I'm, I'm a big salmon fisherman myself, and Alaska's done a lot of damage to BC stocks. They, they've they really poorly regulated the, you know, we haven't done a great job in Canada of regulating our fisheries, but I would say they've done a worse job. And a lot of the fish that are passing through Alaskan waters are headed to BC rivers. And so it seems a little ridiculous that we're, you know, our regulations are protecting the watersheds, but then they just catch the fish that we're protecting the habitat for, but then arguing about a mine that might flow into their their area. So it's a little hypocritical in my point of view, uh, but that's in the mining stage, which is not my expertise. Hmm. Um so yeah, to summarize, it, it, it's not an issue getting permits for for withdrawing water. You're using a small amount when you're when you're diamond drilling. Mm. So, but that's not something that slows you down. And and I do want to talk about the life forms that live in in those waters. And and, and as a whole, environmental standards have only gotten tighter over recent years, as, as we just touched upon, I suppose. But do you expect wildlife? ecosystem regulation to grow as well and, and and is that already a drag on the exploration process where like i don't know what it is like uh, caribous or whatever else it might be that you have to 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 permit for or get special go through special regulation or something like that yeah it, it, no it, it, it things are definitely changing uh and caribou is a great example so i've got a friend who staked a really interesting vanadium project um in north central british columbia and that area was then turned into a caribou reserve and uh he has no ability to get a permit there now and he's in, I, I believe he's in court against the bc government to either get compensation or or find a solution to be able to work it so yeah i i, I do see that changing uh basically anywhere in the golden triangle or in the uh probably in the tutagon amanique area uh, there is wildlife in those areas. They're remote. They're, you know, there's a lot of wildlife. I, I, I spent a lot of years hunting. I don't have any time anymore in the fall because it's generally marketing season. Um, but uh, you do have to, as part of your permit, you do need to provide a wildlife management plan that basically has uh, flight paths that you need to take with a helicopter to avoid uh, a certain habitat. Uh, there's a time period on your permit. To, for example, uh, in, in the Golden Triangle, they generally, without a more detailed management plan, uh, you generally can't start expiration until July 15th, until October 31st. Uh, and the reason for that is because the caribou are, are having their land or their their kids um, in the spring, and you don't want to be buzzing them, buzzing them and stressing them out when they're when they're having newborns. Uh, so you need to, you need to find a workaround, uh, which is created by a biologist, uh, in order to have an exemption from that, which can be done. Like we've done, I've done that before. So it, it's not that they it's not that they can't do these things. It's just, you need to follow the due process and actually, uh, have the studies done and whatnot. And it's not too onerous of a thing and it's not too costly. Um, one other thing though, that, uh, kind of on that topic, one thing that's changed significantly in, uh, in my career in BC is the requirement for archeological assessments. So that's something that wasn't really done early in my career. Early in my career, there was something called the chance find procedure, which, which still exists, where it's basically a, a process for if you come across uh, an artifact. Um, 
that was basically the limit of, of, of it early in my career. Now you actually go in and you can do a desktop study, uh, which will basically classify different areas as high, uh, moderate and low archaeological potential. And generally you can't work in it. Like you can't disturb the ground, like build a drill pad um, in a high area without actually having an archaeologist clear the area on the ground. So that, that is another layer, uh, but it doesn't prevent work. Uh, it's just another hoop you got to jump through, um, which can provide delays if you're not on top of it. Um, so, yeah. That is, the, the, so whatever you, one of these things I'm, I'm hearing delays, and we, this might be a big question, but what happened, like if I, if I staked some ground in, in BC and whatever, there's something left, how long do I, can I expect that process to take from me staking ground to me putting out assays into the market? Like what's, what you said, that's a, it's a couple of years, I suppose, but how long is that? Well, if you stake the ground and you immediately start the permitting process, uh, it could be say nine months. So say you stake the ground in the fall and you, uh, you start the permitting process and, you know, you consult, uh, with the indigenous groups right after staking the ground, um, you could have a permit in time for summer, and okay. then, uh, and then, you know the the lab the lab will be your other hurdle to get over <laughs> with your assets. But I think that I think those time frames have improved quite a bit since the the pandemic mm -hmm. era. But uh, it, you know it, it varies what you're doing too. Uh, we've applied, you know, our permits are good for five years and they're called, they're what's called a multi-year area-based permit. So, uh, our permits range from, I think in the ballpark of a hundred to 150 or so, uh, drill pads. Okay. And that doesn't limit how many holes you can drill off a drill pad. It's a disturbance-based permit. Um, and it's actually not, con it's confined to the overall area of the permit, but you don't have to pre-pick your drill pad locations for five years. You got to put that out each year prior to the work, what you're going to do that year. So that might require, uh, clearing those areas each year with an archeologist prior to drilling, but that could be done in the beginning of the spring, uh, leading into uh, drill pad building and then, and then drilling, um, and, we're looking at ways to clear a bigger area with one go uh, versus having to do it each year. Nine so months sounds very, it sounds good, but it sounds optimistic. Is that, is that the optimistic case or is it because in, in my experience or again, gut feeling here, but I feel like it takes longer. In some of these occasions it could take two years. What, what's the, what, what's the thing that slows you down the most? Like what, what's the main thing that could go wrong within that whole permitting process? So, you know, we ran into our own issues in with our, our Extol project, which is was our listing project, which, which we started founded the company on. Uh, so that project I staked privately and, and vended into Kingfisher. And it was, uh, you know, incredibly prospective VMS belt. So it's a it's a sliver of the Yukon Tanda terrain on the BC coast. Uh, so same rocks as the Finlayson Lake District where the Kudzakaya mine uh, BMC, a private British company, is building in the Yukon. Uh, the old Wolverine mine, um, Yukon Tanda stretches through the Tintina Belt. So there's other VMS prospects. So it's a, <laughs> a highly prospective area that had VMS occurrences. It had a historic resources in the area, um, and it took us two and a half years to get a permit there. Uh, and the permit had conditions on it that we basically couldn't meet. We ended up dropping the project. We didn't. We weren't able to get consent uh, from the indigenous groups there. And I would say one of the biggest issues with that project was, uh, from a you know, from our standpoint, was that just the complexity of the indigenous groups in the area. There was six overlapping indigenous groups in that area, whereas our project in the Golden Triangle has one, the Taltan. So I think that's one point that investors should really look at. And there are resources online where you can find the traditional territories of indigenous groups in BC. If there's multiple overlapping areas, it's going to make things way more complicated because A, you know, different groups might have different timelines for dealing with consultation. Uh, one might be 
very well funded and organized and able to, you know, move quickly through it because they have a high capacity for that. And another group might not. So, you know, you're the weakest link, if you want to call it that, or, or the, you know, the group that that, has, that is going to take the longest time is going to hold that up. Um, and then you get into like impact benefit, like agreements and whatnot. And if you're dealing with six different groups, that's going to be very challenging. Um, so ultimately, the, the complexity of, of how many groups are there has a big impact. And I think what you've seen with some delays directly relates to that. But then within traditional territories, even with, within the Taliban, I know there's a company that uh, recently had a, they're, they're, I think it's gone to the Supreme Court now, and they had a, a permit, that, uh, they had a draft permit, and then it was denied. Uh, and it, it sounded like it was a complete flip of it. Um, I, don't, I can't really comment on on the record on why I think uh, things might have, have gone sideways there. Uh, I don't know the entirety of it. Uh, I do have some ideas why, but uh, ultimately, like within each traditional territory, there's going to be areas of more cultural significance uh, hmm. for a variety of reasons. And there might be competing interests in those areas. Other industries such as uh, hunting, so guide outfitters might have an area there. And if it's if it's if you know if you're if you're trying to drill holes in their honey hole where they make say sixty thousand dollars on a hunt, uh, there's going to be a competing interest in that area, and the the that group itself will have to weigh the the pros and cons of you know what's going to benefit the community more. So it's it's not simple. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's it's very challenging for the, your average retail investor to do this level of due diligence, which, uh, you know, it's not straightforward. Right. So the, how do I deal with that? It is not straightforward. That's where I wanted to go with this. And, and that's really what I'm trying to get out of this conversation is, is how do I know in advance? I suppose what you're telling me here, what I'm getting out of it is that the number of groups each company has to deal with is almost directly related to the speed or, or the time that it takes them to get permitted. So if, if someone's dealing with five different groups, the chance of them getting a slowdown is much larger than someone who's going to be dealing with one or two groups. That's kind of what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, I agreed. Uh, one thing I, like, I don't have a solution, but one suggestion I would make is look at a project and see if it's, if it has a history of getting permits, <laughs> You know, if you're in an area that has had a substantial amount of historical work, it, 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 you know, it could be that it was just in an era when there wasn't much consultation and, and people got the permits. But it could also it, it could also mean that uh, it, it just happens to be in an area that, that there isn't a lot of opposition and and that, you know, a lot of people have, like locals have worked at before. So there, there is a, a bit of a connection for people. Uh, to seeing that area worked. So, you know, this goes into the going into new areas that nobody's looked before. That poses a risk. Whereas if you're in an established camp uh, or somewhere that's seen historical work, I would I would feel safer investing in an area like that. That's a very good point. So one of my questions should be, what's a recent example of a company that's done a deal with those first nations that you're dealing with and has there been historic work? When was it? Because sometimes there has been historic work, but it was, you know, 70 years ago or something like that, two, three generations ago. And maybe the current generation is not as inclined to, to support mining and exploration as, as the previous. That's kind of what I'm getting out of this. Well, if there's a consistent history of work there that would, okay. uh, that I would like to see that. Um, I would say, you know, like it, it might've actually been surprising that we were able to permit our gold range project, uh, given that it was very difficult for people in that area. Um, I would, I would say, you know, Vancouver Island doesn't have a great history of, uh, of, of, of people getting projects permitted and there hasn't been nearly as much mine develop in that area as, as elsewhere. Um, whereas, you know, the, the, the Southern BC, the Quinell trend in Southern BC, the, the, you know, the Southern Porphyry belt where like Highland Valley, Copper Mountain, um, that area has seen, it, it appears to be a little easier. 
but then there's a, there's examples, you know, that take away from that, like the Ajax mine didn't get a permit, but that I don't, I think that was, there might've been an indigenous component to that. I, I can't comment on that, but it was also a right near a, a town of Kamloops, like a hundred, I don't know, probably a close to a hundred thousand person town that uh, is a resource town, but there's a new housing development and they were worried about uh, dust basically and noise uh, affecting that community. So <laughs> there's a lot of nuance to this and, and it, it, yeah, it, it does take a lot of, a lot of work, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it still is a, a better process than a lot of other places on earth where there's, you know, wars going on or, or dictatorships or things like that. Hmm. Fear. Uh, what those other places often have though is lower exploration costs and, and, and again, quick, quicker permitting times and i suppose this is where where uh, an investor has to, to 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 look at the risk reward and and, and kind of determine what they want to go after but we're touching up on a good point which is cost of exploration that's actually part of a framework that i stole from craig perry of inventor capital and as you mentioned visla copper who's also looking for a copper porphyry up there and i just spoke to him last week but so he he always says size of the price which we'll talk about later when we get to the geology part cost of the test and chances of success. So cost of the test being one of the, well, you know, cost of the test is directly influenced by how well developed a, a jurisdiction is, right? Uh, because of infrastructure and stuff like that, uh, availability of labor. So you do want to be close enough to a town where you can have labor or close enough to a big town where you can you know, even have a drilling company or whatever else, but you don't want to be too close to it where it's a hindrance to the town. So, um, yeah, talk to me about infrastructure maybe here for a second from a um, uh, standpoint of, uh, albeit roads or power, just how's, how developed is the infrastructure? Yeah, so it, that that's variable too. You know, if you're in southern BC, uh, there's tons of logging roads all over the place. Uh, and if you can drill off a road, it's going to be way cheaper than drilling off a helicopter. Um, so, the you know, the expiration costs are going to be, there's there's a big <laughs> you know, the variation between helicopter drilling, say in the Golden Triangle versus road access drilling elsewhere. Uh, the way I look at it is the prize in the Golden Triangle is huge because the largest deposits of base here are there and the highest grade deposits. So you you have to weight that. Um, but going back to other jurisdictions on this, you know, the Andes, the prizes are huge. Drilling costs, even if they're off a road, are not cheap there. They need, you need, generally need to truck water in um, you're drilling at high elevation. You also have a shorter working season because of the elevation. Um, more likelihood for equipment issues when you're in a high elevation. Uh, so it's it's not just that BC has high expiration costs. It's uh, a lot of places do. Um, but you know, working towards this, you know, being towards the center is definitely going to reduce your costs and using local workforce will reduce your costs too, because you're not transporting them all over the place. Um, and that's one thing that, that is handy in certain parts of BC is, you know, skilled workers, drilling companies tend to be focused in these mining hubs. So uh, Kamloops, Prince George, uh, Smithers, BC have a lot of drilling companies based there. And you want to be near a drilling company because if something goes wrong and you need spare parts coming in, uh, you want them as soon as, as quick as possible. Uh, you don't want to be paying, uh, you know, well, maybe if the if the drill malfunctions, you're not paying standby, they are. But you're paying standby for the whole comp for everybody else, like the helicopter, uh, the crew and all that. So you want you want services nearby mm. and you don't want to be transporting fuel all the way across. You know, you know all these things factor in. Um, but, you know, you can look at areas like it's not just the expiration cost it's also going to be the cost of building a mine uh, mm -hmm. and what it's going to take to make something economic if you need to build a road for hundreds of kilometers say through the arctic you're going to have to find something pretty damn special to make it work there and your expiration program needs to have that in mind like that prize needs to be huge justify the whatever it costs like 1500 meters i know bhp is now exploring on ellesmere island uh it, <laughs> It's going to have to be pretty damn special to be exploring on Ellesmere Island. Like I, like Elon must be mi might be mining on Mars before you're mining on Ellesmere Island. Wow, um, that is that. That's a fair point. Um, the, it, it does it 
does it kind of go from south to north BC from more developed to less developed or is it really kind of hubs and, and centers that you have like you mentioned smitters um and stuff like that but how, can you is there a rule of thumb that you're like oh if it's in southern BC good if it's northern BC not as good let's have a deeper look um well I the way I look at it is that it has to be weighted with the prize potential and the expiration maturity you know, if you're looking for something uh, really big, you might want to go somewhere with lower expiration maturity. Um, a good example of that would be Ivanhoe's success in the Congo. Um, there's issues in the Congo and a lot of people won't won't invest in the DRC. But a lot of these frontier areas uh, have bigger you know, size potentials. So that can outweigh uh, the additional costs of working in those areas or risk. Um so it's, I, I wouldn't say it's like a blanket thing. Uh, you know, in the Golden Triangle, Scotty, uh, Brad at Scotty Resources, they're drilling off roads, but they're also drilling with a helicopter off roads. Or, or, you know, camp might be on a road, but then they're drilling with a helicopter. Uh, we are drilling with a helicopter, but we can see the highway and the power line from it. It's about, uh, well, within nine kilometers of, of the road. And we had a camp on the highway last year. So it's, you know, it's not crazy expiration cost, but it's definitely more than if we were in southern BC. But we see it as being a greater potential opportunity than a lot of areas in southern BC. Hmm. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a complicated thing. You kind of have to balance all of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, it and it is. I feel like this. The conversation so far is really focused on those on that uh, cost of the test because I mean, regulatory, environmental, and and local permits they might slow you down and that directly adds to your cost over time i mean if you're not able to drill but you have to keep existing as a company that adds on to the cost it could result in dilution and so on and so forth um let's do talk about the size of the prize which again bc is a, a big place so there's not one thing that you can tell me oh the size of the price is great because it's bc or is a nine out of ten or whatever else but um when i'm thinking of bc and and well i i, I might be wrong here um, and of course, that's not everything that BC has to offer, but I'm thinking about kind of low-ish grade porphyries, if you will. Like, like that's the first thing that pops to mind when I'm thinking about BC. So talk to me about the geological setting here in BC. What do you like so much about it? And why do you think the size of the price is worth it? Yeah, so I'm touching on grade uh, and size of deposits. So you know, there's lots of areas in the tropics that have the advantage of they have super gene enrichment, which can really upgrade uh, the overall grade on a porphyry. Uh, often it's not a huge tonnage component, but it can be stupid high grade that can really bump everything up. Mm. Uh, we don't have a lot of super gene in BC, and that has to do with glaciation. It's soft material at surface that's been eroded. So uh, it's not to say that there wouldn't have been super gene. There almost certainly was. Uh, the, For example, like the Quinell terrain, and the stikine terrain were formed in a tropical environment and then migrated with plate tectonics and collided with BC. So they were, you know, you want that warm, tropical, wet environment to form, form supergene. Um, so we generally don't have that in BC, but we have plenty of examples of excellent grade. Uh, you know, Red Chris had, I, I was really trying to find it. I, I put a tweet the other day, just to, don't think anybody even looked at it, but it was about, uh, you did, but it was about uh, the video you had with Craig the other day talking about grade. And I saw this one chart in the past that had the top uh, porphyry copper gold intercepts around the world. And Red Chris, I think maybe it was like the top 20 or something like that. And Red Chris uh, had multiple intercepts on that table. Um, you know, Philo would be on that. Uh, I think uh, Los Sulfados was number one on there, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, most of them are in the Andes, but a lot of them are here. Um, you know, and well, not a lot of them, but the, the Red Chris ones are, are here. So there is potential for grade like that. I know that at KSM, which is considered to be a, a massive tonnage, low grade system, um, there's high grade intercepts within that. You know, if you were to reevaluate that with smaller tonnage, uh, it could actually be a very good grade mine. Uh, you know, they've, they've, they've got like percent copper kind of stuff within the cores of those and uh, over a gram gold. Hmm. So there's definitely potential for excellent intercepts. You know, even on our project, uh, the Williams uh, deposit, 
which we did IP over this year, and I'm looking forward to announcing our our, our expiration targets there. There's high grade intercepts within it. Uh, there's I think just shy of 100, like 96 meters of 1.25 percent copper equivalent sub interval. Uh, you know that I, I plotted that up against Hercules. Uh, that initial drill result that got the big barrack investment and it's three quarters uh, is as good of an intercept from a grade tonnage perspective. Um, so th there's definitely grade potential. Uh, you just got to find it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, the, you know, like one of the reasons why I think a lot of these systems are lower grade is because the cost of mining is pretty low in BC. So you're able to include more peripheral lower grade mineralization, which subsequently increases the tonnage, but it decreases the overall grade. So mm -hmm. I think it's partly a function of just the ability that we can successfully mine a lot of these systems here. What, what, do you, what are the chances of success then in, in, in that case? I mean, you can successfully mine it if you have it and if you, if you find it. And when you find it, it tends to be big. Um, and again, talking on a, on, a, on a province scale, if you will, it, it's kind of hard because BC is big. But yeah, how, how do you even define the chances of success here? Well, I think you define you can define the chances. Of, you can look at it from just the interest of majors coming in. You know, Newcrest, highly regarded as one of the smartest exploration teams out there, came in for 70% of Redcrest, and they continue to put out good results. Their block cave operation is well underway. Um, I've, a good friend of mine who I went to university with is is underground daily mapping the face of 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 the uh, of the decline. Um, so that's well underway. And then Newmont picked it up, and I think Newmont picked it up for the reasons I addressed, but also probably because Newcrest is so well known for their block caving capability from their experience in the in the Macquarie Arc in the Katy area, and that is a technology that will be key to unlocking a lot of the deposits in the Golden Triangle. And Tom Palmer has come out and said, I think he said that BMO that they plan on being in the in the Golden Triangle for a decade. And you know, given what they've got, that probably means that they're going to be looking for more systems in that area. Um, and you know, if if they're there, what's to say other majors aren't going to want to be there? Um, if you look at a map of of somewhere in in the Andes, you'll see it's not just one or two majors. <laughs> Everybody wants a piece of the pie. Um, so what's it going to take? It's going to take an economic discovery uh, and then, you know, having the right relationships, uh, you know, an area where you can actually build a mine. So, you know, if you're if you're putting something underneath a glacier, that's going to be a lot more challenging than something in reasonable topography. Um, so th th there's a lot of these variables at play. here. <laughs> it's not a simple answer. <laughs> mm. Yes, it d definitely isn't a simple answer. I did. I hesitated asking that question, but I think you still did a good job of, of actually answering it and putting things in, in perspective. What else though? What else is is kind of on your mind when it comes down to BC? Um, challenges, opportunities. I, I don't want to make this into a SWOT analysis uh, or 90% of people are, that are listening to this still are going to leave. But yes, what else do you like? What else worries you? Um, well, what worries me is uncertainty with the, the Tenure Act. Uh, I don't really know how it's going to go, and I, I don't know how it's going to affect us. Um, we are in an area where, like specifically to Kingfisher, we are in uh, the Golden Triangle, and there isn't really any ground you can stake. <laughs> um, and I think it will have an implication on new staking in particular. Um, so it might not apply to us as much, but I'm sure there'll be some application of it. Um, what I like to see, though, are uh, good examples of, of new of new good grade systems being defined. Uh, NAC would be a good example. Um, uh, Nate Smith just sent me a, on on uh, on Twitter. He just sent me a message today. I had been busy working this week, and I didn't have a chance to actually go through their news release. And it looks like they've hit some pretty interesting mineralization there uh, with. Uh, you know, a new style of mineralization with potentially evidence of telescoping, uh, which is interesting. That's something we've just identified in our project, actually. And and I'm, I'm trying to put together a good argument uh, to, to support that thesis. Uh, so it's, it's interesting seeing that. I, I don't know those like continental porphyry systems that well. Um, we're dealing with these island arc systems, whereas in the Babine Belt, the, the younger systems formed, you know, 
off, subduction off the BC coast versus subduction off in, you know, tropical environment. <laughs> So it's a little different because telescoping, uh, it occurs when you've got really rapid uplift while mineralization is happening. Um, and I don't know the the ins and outs of the tectonic history of, of, of that area, you know, in relation to was this an area that was really going up and then epithermal mineralization coming down. That's a pretty uh, complicated geological concept to get into on a call like this. Uh, but there are good papers out there and, 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 uh, Dick or Richard Silito, the most famous porphyry geologist, has a good has a good paper on that. Mm. I can find for you. It, it definitely is uh, too complicated of a subject to get into with me. I don't know about the call. I don't think that it's the call's fault, but it, it's probably my fault. Um, but it, when do you think you're going to have some results out for KFR? When's the next time you and I are going to be talking? So uh, we're currently writing a release. Uh, it's a lot of work because it's... Uh, well, it's drill targets for next year. Uh, so uh, I'm hope, hoping for a couple of weeks from now. And uh, it's going to show some pretty damn exciting, like, well, I'll, I'll say it when we got it there, but like we've got probably the best drill target I've seen for a porphyry system that I've ever worked on. Uh, at our Williams deposit, it looks like it's open uh, and there's already good grades. There's 350 meters of, of 0.4 gold, 0.33 copper, I believe. So there's already good grades. Uh, it seems like the market doesn't recognize that we've actually got that. And it's recent drilling and it's opened and, you know, a lot of these holes bottom in mineralization and uh, the scale of the target compares to uh, to other deposits in the region, such as Redcrest and a lot of similarities between say Redcrest, Saddle, Kerr. So uh, pretty exciting on that. And, and then we'll have, we did some IP work over over other areas that are uh, that never had any IP sampling uh surveying done before so uh it, i'm pretty excited with what we've got going into going into next year and uh you know we will have to raise money for it but uh i've got a very high degree of confidence going into our drill program next year much higher than we we've had on the project yet and i'm really happy that we did this work uh really to to shore up these targets you know you're working it is more exp expensive exploration working in the mountains uh so you need to be really damn sure you, you've got a good handle on your targeting and we've got good people on board, you know, Charlie Gregg and our VPX scale, who is an expert in the region. We added a new technical advisor, uh, Stephanie Sikora, who, who did her PhD uh, in Australia on the Lahir project and worked for first quantum all over the world on porphyry copper gold systems. Um, I, I was really, I, you know, I announced it in our last press release, but she offered to join our tech advisory team because she was so excited uh, after having mapped on a bunch of different targets this year. So things look very good for us. We didn't drill this year, so we're not going to have anything uh, that's going to, you know, <laughs> change us to a hundred million dollar company or anything like that. But uh, our prospects look very good going into a, into a drill program for next year. And I, I, I think we'll, we'll have a very good program. Well, I'm very much looking forward to talking with you as that program rolls out and as some assays come back from that. So thank you so much for this overview of BC and hopefully speak soon. Yeah, great to chat.